Hello, my dear viewers. This amazing story will be very instructive for you. It is very interesting and beautiful. I wish you enjoy watching it. What's wrong with your head? The young man braked sharply. He jumped out of the car and started yelling at Alice. I'm sorry, I didn't do it on purpose. Alice made a frightened face and tears came to her eyes. Are you sick of living? Throwing yourself in front of a cop. Then I'll be responsible for you. The owner of the car couldn't calm down. He gave her an appraising look from head to toe and calmed down a bit. Alice seen this task is to distract the young man, while her buddy discreetly opens the door and pulls out the purse. They spotted the young man at the gas station and waited for him around the corner. Thomas persuaded Alice to help him just once while his girlfriend was in the hospital. He's the only breadwinner in the family and can't lie on the couch doing nothing. Where did you come from so early? Already with a smile asked the man, not taking his eyes off her beautiful face. But at this moment Alice, all trembling from fear, transfers her look at Thomas, cautiously opening the door and slipping his hand behind the handbag carelessly thrown on the seat. The stranger turns around sharply but Thomas has already managed to get a good distance away. You're saying you didn't do it on purpose. He grabs Alice's hand. We're going to the police. So you're a badger, the young man concludes with undisguised anger. Alice tries to pull her hand away. The word police makes her heart sink. There's no way she can go to the police. She's unregistered and undocumented. If he takes her to the police now, it'll be the end of her. I have nothing to do with this young man. She started to pity and plead. But the man opened the door, shoved the girl into the car, locked the doors just in case. He took a couple steps and started to fall to the ground. Alice saw Thomas behind him with a brick in his right hand. He quickly grabbed the key fob and unlocked the car. Thomas, are you crazy? We don't need to go to jail for murder. Alice stammered, her eyes squared in horror. Thomas leaned over to the man. He's breathing. He'll live. I put him down gently. Let's go before he wakes up. Thomas ran forward. Alice ran after him. They ran out into the roadway, trying to leave the scene of their crime as quickly as possible. Thomas turned his head and didn't notice the high curve, but tripped. He lost his balance and fell. Alice jumped to him. She knelt down. Thomas' eyes were closed. He didn't move or make a sound. Alice screamed loudly. She tried to rouse him. A girl walked by. She helped Alice call an ambulance. Alice met Thomas when her bag with money and documents was stolen from her at the train station. Not knowing what to do, she paced the platform with her eyes brimming with tears, watching passengers boarding the train, presenting their passports and tickets. Her ticket was in her bag, which disappeared in a second. All she had to do was turn her back. I don't know. I don't have anywhere to go. Thomas is gone and his girlfriend's in the hospital. I'm staying with them temporarily. I don't have the key either. Alice struggled to get her words out. She was clutching her purse to her chest, determined not to leave a clue. I see, the girl sighed heavily. Foreign, she started the car and carefully drove forward. You'll live at my place for now. Your acquaintance will be discharged. You'll move in with her. My name is Olivia, by the way. She introduced herself. Alice. Alice sniffed her nose and tried to put a smile on her face. Let's get acquainted. Alice told Olivia her playful story. She told it to the best of her ability, holding nothing back. She was getting ready to leave. She was sure the girl didn't want any trouble and wouldn't leave her alone. I work in a restaurant. We'll go to work together tomorrow. I'll see if I can get you a job as a waiter. You'll get a little internship. You look impressive. I think they'll hire you. Olivia reassured her and stroked Alice's head. How old are you? I hope you're of legal age. Soon it will be 19, still worried, answered Alice. Do you want coffee? The new acquaintance asked. I will, Alice answered. Olivia stopped the car near a small restaurant. This is where we will work. Olivia answered Alice's mute question. Sit here for a while. Olivia left her alone. Alice sat down on the edge of the couch and began to look at the restaurant from the inside, beautiful tablecloths on the tables, massive chandeliers, stairs to the second floor, colorful napkins on each table. The restaurant is still empty. It's not opening time yet. 
Alice didn't notice how Olivia approached her. Next to her stood a man with a look of displeasure on his face. This girl right here, she's my cousin, I can vouch for her as myself. You say the papers were stolen. The man looked at Alice from head to toe. Stolen, Olivia answered for her. I'll explain her situation to the chief. Hopefully he'll understand. We'll get the paperwork back, she continued. Arthur asked for a table for tonight. I hope I can talk to him about my sister. For now, let her practice carrying the trays. A week later, Alice was trusted to go out and serve customers. Good evening, you've already chosen. She asked the duty phrase, which just flew from the teeth, like a learned mechanism. And only when the man takes his eyes off the menu and looks at her. A chill runs down Alice's spine. A compulsive fear envelops her entire body. At the table sits the man who had been hit on the head by Thomas and from whom they had stolen the purse. What an unexpected encounter, he says and leans back on the couch. I'm sorry, you must have me confused with someone else, Alice said pathetically, pretending that she had never met the young man before. Remembering the details of their meeting on the road, she was ashamed and unpleasant. What are you saying? The man made surprised eyes. I recognize your face even with my eyes closed. Where's my purse? He gestured for Alice to bend over and whispered in her ear. If a single piece of paper goes missing from my bag, one call, you'll be in jail for a long time and you'll spend the last few years in the slammer. He turned away from Alice and turned to his companion. Darling, have you chosen yet? Alice took the order. She turned around and walked out of the hall on wobbly legs, immediately approached the administrator and began to remove her uniform. What happened? Olivia asked in surprise. Just yesterday, she had been promoted to administrator. Olivia was very proud and happy that she was able to get this position. She was tired of working as a waiter. She was tired of running with trays in the hall and adjusting to the mood of each client. A very scary story happened. If I don't quit, they'll fire me anyway. The man you asked to serve you is the man Thomas hit over the head, Alice muttered. What? Olivia's eyes almost popped out of her head. Do you know who that is? You cut it up to your ass. She waved her hand and shook her head. I thought I'd get in trouble for you. Sit here. Anyway, you have to finish your shift, and then we'll see. She looked at Alice sternly and went out. Alice sat down obediently on the chair. In front of her eyes stood the angry face of the young man. She sighed, put her hands on her knees and calmly waited for the verdict. I wonder who he was. Not the chief of police of the neighborhood, I hope. Alice spit over her left shoulder three times. That's all I need. If I'd known there'd be trouble like this, I never would have contacted you. Now I'm hanging on by a thread. Olivia shook her head. Go up to the second floor, to the principal's office. Remember I vouched for you. How you behave will determine how I stay here. I'd already explained everything to Arthur. He wants to talk to you in person. Watch me. Olivia wagged her finger. For the first time, Alice saw fear and worry in her older friend's eyes. I'll do my best, Alice said and headed for the principal's office. The main thing is not to let Olivia down. She's good. And she's been there for me in my time of need. Why do I have to get everyone in trouble? My sister's always trying to get me out of here. She sent me to go to school. I hope I'd get in. I'd get a dormitory. During my studies, I'd meet a guy, get married, and never go back to my parents' apartment. And I was only one grade short. And of course, I didn't get into the budget. I had to return home. The station stole my documents. I may go to work and remember my kindness. He could barely contain his laughter as he watched her hurry out of the office. Tugging at the handle, it wouldn't budge. Finally, Alice figured out to turn it down. She opened the door and dashed out, heels blazing. There's something about her. I'll help her get her papers back, and then we'll see. Diligent, diligent. That's the kind of employee I need. I can always fire her. What's up? Olivia waited for her friend on the first floor, praying to God it was a bloodbath. As long as Arthur didn't jump up and change his mind, when Olivia told the chief the sad story about Alice, she told him that she couldn't get past Alice's plight, knowing full well that she could get in trouble for feeling sorry for a complete stranger. Arthur believed Olivia and promised not to take harsh measures. 
really in one second made a 180 degree turn and changed his opinion to the opposite. So far, so good, I apologized. I said I'm not a criminal. I swallowed my words and began to hastily recount my conversation with Chief Alice. Well, that's good. If he wanted to fire you, he would have done it yesterday. I've known him a long time. Arthur's not going to bend over backwards for anyone. Olivia exhaled and smiled. You were born with the shirt on your back. Just don't let me down. There's a lot of temptation here. You need to be able to stop in time and do not break the wood. Arthur called Alice into his office. Here, he handed her her papers and her bag. Where did you get this? Alice still couldn't believe her eyes. I'm a magician, he laughed. My neighbor is the director of the train station. The janitor was cleaning the square this morning and found your bag. He took the fine to the station duty officer. Of course, there was no money in the bag, but thieves don't need documents. Arthur looked at Alice with undisguised interest. This is fantastic. Alice grabbed her bag. I don't even know how to thank you. She looked at her documents and could not hide her joy. Passport, birth certificate, high school diploma. Everything was safe and sound. Alice even cried from the pleasure. But I don't need to get all wet here. You should be happy with what you have, not sad about what you don't. Let's just say you're a lucky man. A woman's tears hadn't worked on Arthur in six years. Not since he divorced his wife. But Alice's sobbing managed to melt his icy heart and sympathize with him. Thank you very much. Can I go? Barely holding back tears of joy, she said quietly. For some reason, I didn't want to let the girl go. To look at her genuine joy gave him great pleasure. But there was no reason to keep Alice in his office any longer. Go. Arthur nodded and praised himself for his cleverness. And try not to lose anything else. I will try. Smiling all over her face, she replied. Alice was in a great mood. She waltzed around the room with a tray in her hands. Receiving tips from not greedy customers and feeling absolutely happy, beautiful, charming, and even lucky. So a few days passed. Arthur gives the order to book a table for nine people. Alice served the company. All evening Arthur's friend pelted Alice with compliments. He made jokes in her direction, shot his eyes at her and openly courted her, trying not to let her leave his table, even for a few minutes. Alice only smiled, kept silent and nodded, when all the guests were already tipsy. The young man, not seeing the object of his adoration in the hall, went in search of her. He found Alice in the back room. He made a bold move on her. He pinned her against the wall and started fooling around. The price of admission is one passionate kiss, he said. Stop it right now, Alice whispered, shrugging off his insolent harassment. Alice pressed herself into the wall and looked at her bow with square eyes of fear. Don't be afraid of me. It won't hurt at all. It will even be pleasant. Alice answered nothing and John was tired of trying to persuade her. He put his hands against the wall. He put them on either side of Alice's shoulders. He tilted his head so their lips were at the same level. Stop it right now. I'm going to scream. Alice began to plead with him. He ignored her pitiful cries. John pressed his whole body against her. A few seconds later, Alice heard the sound of tearing. She didn't even realize it was her new blouse snapping at the seams. Buttons flew to the floor, flying in all directions. Help! Alice shouted before John's lips covered her mouth. A moment later, strong hands pulled John away. Alice opened her eyes and saw the chief's angry face. He was staring at his friend with contempt. What's going on here? Why are you harassing my employees? What's it to you? Go to your Elizabeth. Don't stop us from talking to Alice. John grumbled in a disgruntled tone. Arthur took off his jacket and threw it over Alice's shoulders. Are you all right? He wheezed, trying to pull the halves of his jacket together to cover Alice's half-naked body. How can I go out in the hall like this? She wailed looking at herself from all sides and trying to find at least one button on her torn blouse. I'll take you home, Arthur replied in a voice that brooked no objection. And who will serve my tables? Alice continued to lame it, still trying to make herself look good. You don't have to worry about that now. We're going home, Arthur replied in a confident tone. She's not going anywhere with you. Elizabeth is waiting for you in the hall, John grumbled angrily. He lunged at Arthur with his fist, 
but knelt down with his hands wrapped behind his back. If you don't stop, I'll get security. You'll be forcibly removed from this place. You've got your eye on her. John grinned. Alice took off her jacket and handed it to the chief. Holding the hem of her blouse with one hand, she headed for the locker room. Leaving the young men alone and not wanting to get into an altercation, John glared unkindly at Arthur. His face twisted, and he sneered. You want a young body? None of your business, Arthur snarled. John had no choice but to go into the hall. He wasn't going to fight his rival on his territory, but he didn't want to give Arthur the girl. While you're here sipping your wine, your Arthur's not shy about hitting on his new waitress. He's going home with her right now. He turned to a tipsy Elizabeth. Oh, please. I hope it's not that uncouth redneck you've got your eye on. She stinks of stupidity and stupidity from a mile away. Laughed Elizabeth. You shouldn't laugh. John put his hand on her shoulder. I think he has a crush on her. And I think, too. John looked wistfully out the panoramic window. The sight of the city at night made him feel sad. His fists itched with anger at Arthur. Damn him for showing up at the worst possible moment, John muttered. Arthur, maybe you shouldn't see me off. It's embarrassing in front of your friends. Alice tried to persuade him again. She wanted to be alone to calm down. Get her thoughts in order. Consult with Olivia after all. My friends are adults. They'll find their own way home. What about your girlfriend? I'm embarrassed for her. She kept complaining. We'll deal with our girlfriend ourselves. You don't have to worry about her. Elizabeth will be fine. Arthur grinned. Arthur put Alice in the car in the back seat and sat next to her. He gave the cab driver his home address. Alice looked at her boss with frightened eyes. Don't worry, I won't do you anything bad, unless you want me to. He answered the girl's mute question. Arthur, please take me home. I'm not going to you. Arthur turned his head and looked at Alice carefully. He still hoped that she was just putting on a brave face. Alice lowered her eyes, wrinkled her forehead, and nervously bit her lower lip. She's so young. Arthur thought to himself as he watched her blush and try to get rid of his presence as quickly as possible. Alice loudly dictated her address. The cab driver turned his head and addressed Arthur. Where are we going? Take us to the address the girl called. After these words, Arthur put his hand on her knee. But Alice took it away and turned away to the window. It seemed to Arthur that the cab driver took them away in 20 minutes. They didn't want to part at all. Thank you, Arthur. I didn't want to let her go just in an ultimatum form. He quickly paid the driver and followed her out. I'm afraid I'm intruding, but I'd like to ask for a cup of coffee. Arthur's blocking the door. I want to make sure you're going to be all right. I'll have a cup of coffee and go home with peace of mind. Arthur said in his usual commanding tone, leaving Alice no chance to refuse. All right. Alice sighed heavily, took out the key and opened the door. Tell me about yourself. Taking a sip of freshly brewed coffee, Arthur suddenly asked a question. Why do you need it? Alice shrugged her shoulders. Certainly, the chief's behavior was putting her in a stupor. Alice wanted to say goodbye to him, send him away and be alone. She glanced defiantly at her watch. It was still two hours before Olivia arrived. Well, if I'm asking, I need it. Alice told me how her parents had died, how she and her sister had been left all alone how she was almost taken away to an orphanage, how her sister went to work early because they needed something to eat. Then the sister got married. Nothing interesting. Alice concluded. Do you got a boyfriend? No. She answered confidently. Thanks for the coffee. Arthur got up from his chair. I'm going home. And you should get some rest. I'm sorry about what happened. I'll talk to John. I promise he won't come near you again. Arthur leaned down pressed his lips to her cheek and kissed her gently. The brief touch burned her cheek as if he put a hot mug of boiling water on it. Alice shuddered and swallowed loudly. Goodbye, she whispered, her tongue completely numb. Arthur paced in his office from one corner to the other. He was like a tiger in a cage. Today, he could hardly sleep. The image of Alice was in his mind's eye, her torn blouse, her lacy white bra, with one strap torn off. That little girl had taken over his thoughts. For some reason, he wanted to see her again and again, to be always near to help, to support, to lend a helping hand. 
and today Elizabeth showed up at the restaurant at lunchtime. She asked the receptionist to be served by Alice. As a result, she had a scandal, called her a slob. She wrote a complaint and demanded that she be fired. I had to invite Elizabeth into my office. I had to calm her down for a long time. Asked her to calm down and stop yelling. It was a bad idea to celebrate a friend's birthday at her restaurant. Now Elizabeth would not rest until she had achieved her goal. Arthur heard a knock, and then Alice appeared in the doorway. May I? Come in. Arthur, it's really not my fault. Your girlfriend started throwing tissues at me and calling me names. I had no choice but to leave. I know I know, Arthur sighed heavily. Never mind, I'll fix this misunderstanding. He walked over to Alice and took her chin in his hand. He scrutinized her pale face. She's jealous, because she sees you as a rival, and I can't help it. I think I'm falling in love. Arthur felt Alice's fear in his skin, barely restraining himself from pouncing on her and scaring her. His chest was short of air, his body was shuddering with excitement. I can't help it, he heard his own hoarse voice. Arthur put his fingers around her head and kissed her lips passionately. Not expecting such a turn, Alice opened her lips. His tongue entered her mouth and began to do something unimaginable. Alice lost all possibility of resistance. With his right hand, he put his arm around her waist and pulled her tightly against his body. His left hand moved and held the back of her head tightly, giving her no chance to pull away. Is everything okay? He wheezed in her ear. He didn't even think about letting go of her tight embrace. Yeah, I don't know. Her voice was just as hoarse. Who knows? He asked, pulling away slightly and looking at her face. Am I disturbing you? Elizabeth's voice was commanding. Her face twisted with anger. Bright sparks flew from her eyes. Her gaze was hostile, angered, irritated, and intensely unpleasant. Arthur took a step back. He noticed how Alice, her face red as an overripe tomato, began tucking loose strands of hair behind her ear. Then she pulled up her skirt, coughed, and said, Don't ever do that again, Arthur. And without raising her eyes to Elizabeth, she stalked out of the office. Congratulations, Elizabeth clapped her hands to family. What have you come to? Sleeping with a Lamita. Look at her. She smells like country manure from a mile away. None of our friends are gonna give you a hand because you'll be soaked in that stuff yourself. She came closer to Arthur and slapped him on the cheek with all her might. What do you think you're doing? Arthur grabbed his cheek. You and I have worked things out. Why did you come back again? I wanted to cement our truce with you and invite you out tonight, but I see I'm too late. I realized at the party that you had a crush on her. When John went after her, you couldn't hide your annoyance. I hate to break it to you, but John has a crush on this foreign brat just like you. I don't know how you're going to share her. The words came out of Elizabeth like a powder keg. She couldn't remember her rage and anger. She just couldn't stop. She wanted to hit Arthur with hurtful words to tell him that this little bitch was not his format at all. Elizabeth, you've obviously forgotten that you and I broke up. We decided to stay just good friends. That was your initiative, by the way. Arthur was still holding his cheek. I changed my mind. She shrugged in surprise. I'd had a lot of time to think. I'd had a lot of time to sort myself out. Now I'm absolutely sure of my only right decision. I need you. Is your decision to propose to me still on the table? She stared at Arthur with wide open eyes. Elizaveta was 200% sure that having put him in front of the fact, Arthur would not be able to refuse. He would be delighted and propose to her again. Elizabeth, you know the saying, strike while the iron is hot. When I propose to you, that's when you should have accepted. And now, Arthur paused. He didn't want to offend with his categorical refusal, but he wasn't about to give false hope. And now you are carried away by this sweat. Elizabeth helped to finish his thought. Let's call things by their proper names. This girl is worth three rubles at the peasant market. I can't even think who you've traded me for. She laughed hysterically. Elizabeth, let's not insult each other. Remember, I won't hurt the girl. And don't come to the restaurant and put sticks in her Calivia. I repeat for the intelligent and especially gifted. Alice is not to be touched. She's been through enough in this life. I won't let anyone hurt her. I heard you. Elizabeth gave Arthur a cold stare. She squinted her eyes, smirked and left the office without saying goodbye. 
Elizabeth hurried down the hall. When she saw Alice, she came almost right up to her. She grabbed a flute from the table and threw it on the floor. The flute shattered into tiny fragments. A hard line flickered in her smug smile. You can complain to your boss. Slut said that the glass was broken by his fiancé. Satisfied with her prank, she left the restaurant with her head held high. If you're going to react that badly to all the customers who are just making a big fuss, you don't have the nerve. Just be quiet. Agree and ignore it. Olivia calmed her friend down and gave her another admonition. That's easy for you to say. I'm just sick of her. To be honest, I'm afraid of her. I should probably look for a new place of work. Alice carefully picked up the shards from the floor. Her mood was ruined. Her head was spinning from everything that was going on. Do you think it would be better somewhere else? I don't know. Alice sighed heavily. But it's unbearable to work under these conditions, she said thoughtfully. John, I'm offering you a great option. We'll both be better off. You get revenge on Arthur for your humiliation. What a patron he's turned out to be. I'm pitching your idea of opening a brew pub to my dad. Don't worry if I take the job. They'll give you a long-term lease on the place. I'll kill the girl. She'll quit the restaurant. And you're so kind and sympathetic. You apologize to her. You say it's all the alcohol's fault. It'll never happen again. You're sympathetic to her situation. You help her get a job. And then you can do whatever you want with her. I won't be interested. But when this girl leaves Arthur and doesn't show her face, he'll come running back to me like a sweetheart. That's when I'll get even with him. Elizabeth raised her nose arrogantly and grinned wryly. Arthur will be sorry he did this to me. Let's see how he will beg for my forgiveness. And then, I'll think about it, whether or not to forgive him. It's not a bad plan. I've forgotten to think about this Alice thing, though. If only Arthur could be told that friends don't do that. I understand if he said, I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry. That's my girl. But now he's all over me. The girl is interesting. Can you imagine Arthur's face if I come to your birthday party with her? John said dreamily. My birthday is in exactly one month. We don't have much time left. Tomorrow, I'm going to a restaurant with my girlfriends. Tonight, you take a beautiful bouquet of flowers. You go to her and tearfully ask for forgiveness. You don't need to learn how to say nice words. Start courting her unobtrusively. Make her believe you. When she can't take my pressure and leaves the restaurant, will put her in such a hole that she won't get out of it without your support. Elizabeth concluded and raised her index finger up for convincing. And when you get tired of her, let her go back to her village. There's no need to repel other people's finances. Alice, I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me that night. All the fault of your beauty, youth, and too much alcohol. I just can't find a place for myself. Niskash drove up to the restaurant several times. I wanted to see you and apologize. I couldn't stop feeling ashamed. I stopped sleeping. I stopped eating. Tired of feeling like a scoundrel and a scoundrel. Today, I couldn't stand it. I got up the courage. John handed Alice a huge bouquet of white roses. Alice looked at John and could not understand anything. Not expecting such a turn, she was confused and felt as if not in her plate. Offend the young man who sincerely repented and apologized, did not want to. Alice smiled and accepted the bouquet. Don't worry, John. I understand everything and I don't hold a grudge. You can sleep well. I want to make it up to you and invite you to sit in a calm and friendly atmosphere so we can get to know each other better, just to talk. I wouldn't expect much more than that. John looked at Alice with a guilty face, trying to understand her mood and draw conclusions for himself. No, John. Thank you very much for the flowers, but that's quite enough. I'm not going anywhere with you. I've forgiven you, and I don't hold any grudges. You can sleep well. Alice was about to leave, but John grabbed her arm. Alice, if you ever need my help, here's my card. Call me any time of the day or night. He handed her his card. Thank you. Alice took the card from his hands and put it in her pocket. She was sure that she would never need it in her life. Alice was not going to ask for help from the man who had almost raped her and did not even allow such a thought. Alice walked into the hall with a bouquet of white roses. Olivia's eyes widened beyond belief. What a number. What a beautiful bouquet. He didn't say a word, and then he showed up. It's a little suspicious, but it's a beautiful bouquet. Congratulations. Olivia, he just apologized. 
He slipped me his card and said I could always count on his help. Alice looked at the flowers and couldn't get enough of the beauty. She had never been given such expensive and luxurious bouquets in her life. Olivia went up to the principal's office. Arthur, your fiancé is in the hall with two other bridesmaids. I'm afraid there's going to be another huge scandal tonight. She won't calm down. I've decided to kill the girl, but she's not gonna do it. Call Diana at work. Tell Alice to come up to my office. Try to do without Alice until she arrives, he said tiredly. Okay, Olivia replied. It's a thankless task to sort out who's right and who's wrong. The most effective position, at this point, is compromise. Olivia, as an administrator, could not allow squabbling, swearing and fighting in the hall. She went downstairs and sent her friend to the principal's office. You wanted to see me. Alice, her face pale with excitement, appeared in the doorway. I did, Arthur replied briefly. I invite you to the movies. A hundred years have not been in a movie theater. I want you to keep me company. No objections are accepted. Gather. We leave in ten minutes. I hope that's enough time for you to change. I can't. It wouldn't be very convenient for me. There's your fiancé sitting in the hall. Alice can barely make it out. First of all, she's not my fiancé. Our relationship is long past. We broke up. Secondly, you realize that she came to make another scandal, but we're not going to give her that pleasure. Let her be disappointed today and suffocate from her own bile. Third, we'll have a great time. I've been wanting to ask you out for a long time. Go for it. You won't regret it. Arthur came close to her and wrapped his arms around her waist. Okay. Alice took his hands away and moved away to a safe distance. Go get dressed. I'll meet you in the car in ten minutes, he smiled. Elizabeth was in a foul mood. For two hours now, she had been looking for her victim, ready to pounce on her and crush her like a little bud. But Alice was gone, disappeared in an unknown direction. Elizabeth deliberately walked around the room a few times. She went up to the office to Arthur, visited the restroom, looked even in the back rooms. Alice was nowhere to be found. When she asked her question, the receptionist Olivia answered that Alice had asked to leave for a few days for family reasons. The evening was finally ruined. The only thing left to do was to get drunk and go home. Having achieved nothing and disappointed in her far-reaching plans, Elizabeth ordered another bottle of wine, took out her phone and dialed the number. How was the movie? Arthur drove the car confidently down the wide highway. I liked it. Alice confessed honestly. Me too, he replied. Why don't we stop somewhere for dinner? Arthur, I've got to get home. Alice started to argue. They had a lovely evening, but the image of Elizabeth did not leave her for a minute. Alice kept seeing her angry, glittering eyes in front of her, cheeks flaming with an angry blush and an arrogant look, not willing to consider the opinions of others. I told you, as long as you're with me, no one will dare to hurt you. Let Elizabeth at least suffocate from her own anger. Alice, I have very serious intentions. After saying that, Arthur pulled off to the side of the road. He stopped the car and turned to her with his whole body. I have a proposition for you. Let's pack all your things and you move in with me. Believe me, it's the only right decision. Elizabeth, once she finds out we're living together, she'll finally calm down and stop stalking you. We'll just leave her no choice. I can't she said without hesitation. Why not? What's with all this adolescent maximalism? We're adults. I like you a lot. I think about you all the time. I want you always to be there for me. He looked questioningly at her pale face. Really? I'm not ready. I need to think about it. Alice turned away and bit her lower lip. How long will you think about it? Arthur stood his ground. A day two. Can it be three? She interrupted him. But no more, he answered firmly. Walking Alice to the door, Arthur made himself that this was the last time. Soon he will move Alice to his home and will no longer look out and search for her with his eyes in the hall. She would always be near and no one would dare to say even one bad word to her. Arthur just opened his mouth, deciding to ask for a cup of coffee. But suddenly he swallowed loudly and tried to gather his thoughts. John was standing outside Alice's apartment building, ringing the intercom with determination. What kind of surprise meeting? John, if I understand you correctly, you are here by chance. Arthur grinned, 
took Alice's elbow and continued. You didn't come to see my girlfriend, did you? Or after giving her a bouquet of roses, decided not to stop there. It's not nice to steal girls from your friends. I didn't see this coming. John was confused at first, trying to digest the information Arthur had given him in his mind. He just stared dumbfounded at his friend, then slowly turned his gaze to Alice. Alice, is it true? Are you and Arthur together? He asked with a stretched face. John didn't even believe his ears at first. Arthur's words hit him where it hurt. He was already making plans and calculating profits. John had high hopes for the opening of a new brewery, but sadly not all dreams are destined to come true. Arthur let go of his elbow and put his arm around Alice's waist. In the near future, Alice will move in with me. Really dear, the door opened. On the threshold, they were met by a happy Elizabeth and Alice had a chill running down her spine. Alice listened silently to other people's conversations. She smiled, pretended to be interested, agreed and shook her head in agreement. Arthur immediately introduced Alice to everyone as his girlfriend. The whole evening was near her and practically did not leave her for a minute. The evening was coming to an end. Unnoticeably, everyone went somewhere else. Arthur also went away for a minute. John sat down with Alice. How's married life? Arthur does not offend. Fine, she said. Where's Arthur? I don't know. He said he had to go away for a while. Alice smiled. I'm sure he's with Elizabeth. That couple can't live without each other for long. John tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. What makes you think that? Alice looked at him incredulously. He took Alice's hand and led her to the second floor. Not understanding why she was doing this, Alice followed John in silence. He pushed on the handle. When the door didn't open, he knocked loudly, shook his head and knocked again. Then again, the doors wouldn't open. Why are you doing this? I saw Elizabeth and Arthur come into this room with my own eyes. John whispered in his ear. Elizabeth opened the door about a minute later. She was wearing the shirt Alice had ironed that morning. Alice turned around and walked briskly toward the door. John followed her. Alice, to be honest, I didn't expect this. I thought they were just talking. Please call me a cab. She struggled to find her shoes. I'll walk you out. I don't want to leave you alone. Don't. Tell Arthur I went home. Okay, John answered. Alice couldn't sleep until the morning, still hoping that Arthur will come, explain, say that there was a terrible misunderstanding, that she misunderstood everything and between them there was nothing. But Arthur still did not come home for the night, not call, did not write, and did not ask how she got home. Alice had already packed all of her things. She didn't want to leave without talking to Arthur. After all, why should she run away from his house like a naughty kitten? Alice decided to look into his eyes, to draw a conclusion and realize that she had made another mistake. It was good that everything happened now, when she had not yet had time to fall in love, although I didn't want to break up. But she was not going to close her eyes to all this ugliness. Alice saw through the window as Elizabeth's car drove up. The passenger door opened. Arthur got out first. Elizabeth jumped out after him. They talked about something nice. Elizabeth kissed him on the cheek. He waved to her and went into the building. Hello, Arthur looked at the two bags he had packed. Only a blind man could miss them by the front door. Are you leaving? Yes, Alice answered calmly. Although the storm was already raging in her soul, it was not easy to control herself. May I ask why? Arthur, as if nothing had happened, went into the hall and tiredly sank down on the sofa. He closed his eyes and sighed heavily. I think it's clear enough. I think we were too hasty. I should not have moved to you so quickly. Alice could barely hold back her tears, but she decided that Arthur would not see them. She wouldn't give him that pleasure, but she'd rather cry on Olivia's shoulder. Her friend would understand, support her, and give her advice. You're not even gonna ask me how I spent the night? I know where you were. Elizabeth left you in good hands. What claim can you have against me? I have many, as you say, complaints against you. You didn't even ask me how I was feeling or what happened to me. Arthur paused, but then he continued. I felt sick. I threw up. Elizabeth called an ambulance. They took me to the infectious disease ward. They pumped me full of fluids. I thought I would die. And next to me was not my favorite girl, 
And Elizabeth, she did not leave me. She came with me to the hospital. She waited for me to be admitted, wrote a note to let me go home, picked me up. She brought me back to her place. I slept for a while this morning, and when I woke up, she took me straight to you. And you didn't even ask where I was or what was wrong with me. I'm sorry if I was wrong. I went looking for you. I knocked on the door. Elizabeth opened it. She was wearing your shirt, and you were naked on the bed. What was I supposed to think? Elizabeth told me you ran downstairs like a mad woman. You didn't ask. You ran off with John. That's wonderful. I'm lying almost dying. And she took off and ran away. It's just a kindergarten, Arthur shrugged. His voice was imbued with a hint of irritation and anger. I just can't figure it out. Why she took off your shirt and put it on herself? You don't think that's weird? I don't know. Maybe I stained her dress when I was puking and throwing up. How many shirts like that in town? Maybe it wasn't my shirt. Arthur poured his negativity onto Alice, holding her responsible and practically holding her accountable for her behavior. I hope we talk. We got it all figured out. Can I go now? If God forbid, you get sick again. You already know who you can turn to. Elizabeth will always help you. And I'll take what I can get. Alice got up from the chair and headed for the exit. She got dressed, started rolling out her bag. You still haven't got the message. That nothing happened between us. We're just good friends. Arthur shouted in frustration. No, why? It has come to me that in this triangle, I turned out to be an extra corner. If your friends decided not to inform me, did not call, did not warn, your Elizabeth saw perfectly well that I was bad and unpleasant, but did not consider it necessary. So you and I are just not on the same path. Sorry. Alice took hold of her bag again. What do you want? You do realize that I can just fire you from your job. Where will you go without education and experience? Arthur didn't want Alice to leave. That's not the reaction he expected from her. Of course, he was terribly angry. In a difficult moment, not his favorite girl, but Elizaveta was next to him. This fact did not give him peace. Elizabeth's constant reminders that Alice had not even called once made him nervous, psychotic, angry, perhaps also make some mistakes. Don't worry, I'll quit on my own, muttered Alice. She opened the door. Can I help you? Arthur shouted angrily. No, thank you. Save your strength. You'll need it. Go on then. Just know that I'm not going to chase you for the rest of my life. Arthur was standing by the window. He saw a cab pull up. The chauffeur got out and started helping Alice load her bags. Arthur could barely contain himself from jumping out into the street. Stop. Bring her back home. But he decided to calm down, to rest, to sort out his thoughts. And tomorrow, at work, already calmly talk. Nothing. Let him think about his behavior. It's time to grow up, not to run away from problems, he said out loud. Arthur was indeed very tired. Sleepless night drips. Thank God Elizabeth was always there for him. If it wasn't for her, he might still be in the hospital when he felt much better. Elizabeth took him to her house, put him to bed. I should have called Alice, Arthur thought to himself. Oh, come on. We'll sort it out tomorrow. Nothing. Tomorrow I'll recover. I'll talk to her. I will explain how to behave as a favorite girl. With these thoughts, Arthur closed his eyes and quietly fell asleep. Make up. Olivia, listening to Alice's confused story, made her conclusion and stroked her head. I don't want anything. If he doesn't realize that his friends are provoking me, then he and I are out of his way. Elizabeth couldn't tell me he was sick. She called an ambulance. John didn't say anything. He could have called me. Why? Alice sighed heavily. I've written a resignation letter. You'll give it to Arthur tomorrow. I don't want to discuss this topic anymore. Arthur told me in plain text that he will fire me. I'll make it easy for him. I'll fire myself. Nothing. I'll get a job somewhere. Arthur's not the only employer in town. What if he doesn't pay your wages? Make you work two weeks? Then it's on his conscience. Alice wiped away a tear with her hand. But I won't go back to the restaurant again. And I won't go back to him either. Arthur had already looked out into the hall several times. He hoped to see Alice's upset face. He was 100% sure that she roared all night and at work will walk like a sleepy fly and just peck her nose. Arthur, we've had a personnel change. Instead of Alice, I called Olivia in today. Here, 
Olivia handed him an A4 sheet. I don't get it. Arthur read the resignation letter carefully. With each word he read, the hair on the back of his neck moved more and more, his cheekbones were moving, and curses and profanities were flying off his tongue. What kindergarten? I handed over a piece of paper. She scribbled a statement. And who's gonna do two weeks' work for her? What does she think? What does she expect? Arthur took a lot of air into his lungs. He tried to look calm and reasonable, but it was difficult for him. That's how she decided to say goodbye to me, put a fat cross, and go nowhere. Everything ended quickly, before even having time to begin. And the main thing, inflated the problem on a flat place. She made up for herself, not God knows what. She hid. Cut off all ends, and went on the easiest way. And in fact, more than sure, that missus cries at night in a pillow. But when we meet, she'll smile, pretend everything's fine, even great. Artur wanted to call her unflattering words, but instead he suddenly asked a question that interested him. How is she? I thought it would be worse. She's doing great, Olivia smiled. Good for her. I can't afford it. I wanted to talk to her today. I was hoping she'd calm down. She slept through the night, thought it over. I mean, it's not like it was a big deal. Arthur put a sour smile on his face. He even tried to make jokes. He didn't expect Alice to make such a pass at him. Without thinking, Arthur grabbed his coat. He twisted around, trying to find his scarf, but he couldn't find it and decided to do without it. Hi. He breathed out a sigh of relief when Alice opened the door. We need to talk. He continued. Well... What are you imagining? I'm imagining things. Alice's eyes were shining so brightly. Arthur wished he'd worn sunglasses. Not me, he smiled sweetly. Without asking permission, Arthur gently pushed her aside, stepped into the apartment and closed the door. Do you think you did the right thing? He took off his shoes. Arthur, you don't need to appeal to my conscience. Believe me, I have a clean conscience. I won't come back to you. I won't work in your restaurant either. And now I'm sorry. I'm going on a job interview. Already? Arthur's face is all stretched out. For what? At a men's clothing boutique. What? Arthur hissed. You're not going to work in a boutique, he said categorically. First of all, I'm only going for a job interview and no one has taken me anywhere yet. And secondly, you're nobody to me. Elizabeth will be the one to tell you what to do. I hope she'll listen to your restrictions. Alice sneered. Alice, I don't recognize you. Where has my obedient girl gone? Remember, my dear, it's impossible to live a perfect life. At any minute, something unexpected can happen. There are different situations in life. The main thing is to save your face, not to sink, not to talk nonsense and chuputra. What a wonderful thing to say. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to save face. Though I am young, but I will not allow any Elizabeth laugh at myself. The theatrical production, which he and John play for me I appreciate it. Well done. Seriously approach the issue. Work with a soul coherently. And if you still have not gotten to you, I appreciated their work and put a grade of excellent. I'll deal with Elizabeth. Arthur grumbled. You go deal with it. Forget about us. Elizabeth, what kind of a circus are you putting on? Wearing my shirt. You locked yourself in your room? Without any greeting, Arthur started telling her off on the phone. Then do good to people after that, snorted Elizabeth. What else did your Alice tell you? Just the truth. Let's make a deal. You don't mess with me anymore. Remember, I have a girlfriend who loves me. You don't have to think you're the center of the earth. Why did I listen to you? Going to your party was a bad idea. Are you done? No. There's only one question on my mind. Why did I get sick alone? Elizabeth. I don't want to believe you're capable of such a thing, but if I find out you had a hand in it, God forbid, I will never give you my hand again. Your obsession is starting to annoy me. I really want to believe you. Arthur dropped the call. He didn't want to continue the conversation. His sixth sense told him that Alice was right about a lot of things. Girl, what do you think? What better tie will suit this shirt? Arthur watched as Alice served, most likely, a regular customer. See with what trepidation she picked up a tie. Smiling, and he just devoured her eyes, tried to woo her and threw transparent hints. Arthur was not entirely pleased. He could hardly contain himself. 
To avoid a huge scandal, Arthur just looked at men's things. Hi, he said hello when he saw that she was finally free. Hi, she answered in surprise. Alice looked at Arthur dumbfounded, blinking her painted lashes. They hadn't seen each other for over two months. Arthur's heart was racing, a silly smile hung on his handsome face. You look good, he stretched out. How did you get here? I missed you, Arthur replied hoarsely. For a couple of seconds, she glared at him incredulously. Really? How's Elizabeth? Honestly, I don't know. We had a fight. What a surprise. You had a fight with Elizabeth? Alice's eyes expressed surprise and even incomprehension. Imagine that, grinned Arthur. How can I stay on friendly terms with the man who almost sent me to the next world? He was silent, continuing to watch Alice's surprised face. Just a month later, she herself was in a hospital bed, outing with a girlfriend in a nightclub. She had too much alcohol. In the morning, she had shortness of breath, redness on her skin, heartbeat. She did not pay attention to it, decided that all by itself will pass. Two days later, we had to call an ambulance. It turned out that allergy to some component of alcohol. They took me to the hospital, pumped me up. They said that even in time to address, all could have ended in death. Arthur sighed heavily and grinned wryly. As they say, don't dig a hole for someone else, you'll fall into it yourself. After her recovery, she told me everything sincerely. How she dreamed of divorcing us with you. How she built you in tree. Arthur smiled crookedly, looking at Alice's beautiful face. How I missed her. That smile, confused look, dimple on her chin, he thought to himself. Thank God she's doing well. I hope that having received a boomerang, she will not bother me anymore and will finally leave me alone. And you too. Alice turned her head. Seeing the customer wandering around the store, she turned to Arthur. Sorry, I have to work. It was nice to see you. Alice waved him off and headed towards the man. Arthur didn't feel like leaving the store. There was some kind of ambiguity left after the meeting. He purposefully began to walk around the hall and choose things for himself. Good afternoon. Can I help you? The girl smiled at him with her sweet and charming smile. I would like to be served by Alice. Alice is busy, maybe? Girl, I'll wait for Alice. He interrupted her, continuing to scrutinize the shirts. Good. The girl came up to Alice and whispered something in her ear. Alice looked at Arthur, smiled and shook her head. Arthur bought a sweater, shirt, tie, jeans, a new leather belt. Alice packed the purchases in a branded bag and gave it to Arthur. Thank you for shopping, Arthur. Come back again. Alice had a smile on her face, but she was cold and even aloof. Not a single muscle trembled on her face. Arthur also tried not to show his inner feelings. Although he wanted to shout with all his might that he came here not for these fucking shirts, but to see her. He wanted to see her because he missed her. He was tired of being at home all alone. Arthur took his package from her hands. Thank you. Maybe we could meet tonight. Why? Arthur, do not start again. We with you enough one month to realize it. As if by the way, answered his question Alice. I'm sorry Alice. I feel bad without you. Arthur hesitated when he saw a courier with a beautiful basket of flowers entering the store. Arthur looked at him carefully. When he heard Alice's name, he couldn't help but burst into tears. You have an admirer? I don't know, it's probably a mistake. She shrugged her shoulders in surprise. Here are your flowers. The courier handed her a basket of flowers. Alice signed the receipt, read the card, and smiled guiltily. Yesterday, the man helped to pick up a suit for a wedding to a friend. Today, he decided to thank me. She barely audibly said, I see. Arthur swallowed loudly and choked. You're on. Are you out of your mind? Alice hissed quietly. She was seething inside. I can't believe he started a harem all by himself. He'd been walking around for two months, and I dared to accuse me of all the non-existent sins. But time to tell him everything she thinks, Alice did not have time. A new customer came in. She put a smile on her face, took the basket, looked disapprovingly at Arthur, wished him well and left for the other end of the store. Alice could barely cope with her emotions. She looked sadly at the closed door behind Arthur. It was painful for her to remember that morning when she saw Arthur in the car with Elizabeth. And now that it had finally hit him, 
it hurt twice as much. If Arthur had truly loved her, he would not make her suffer. How could she have left him in such a terrible state? She would be the first to stand at the door of the infectious disease hospital, holding his hand and no Elizabeth could stop her. She and Arthur could be the happiest couple in the city or even on the whole planet. But Arthur managed to undeservedly blame her, to pretend it was no big deal. Chess stood up in defense of Elizabeth and calmly let her go with her things on the way out. From such memories, Alice's eyes glistened. She barely restrained herself from crying. Alice woke up from the sharp call of the buyer. Do you think this color looks good on me? Yeah. She tried to pull herself together. Smile, but it was not quite convincing. It suits you. She finally pulled herself together. Alice's eyes widened when she saw the delivery man with the basket of flowers again. When she heard her name, her palms suddenly sweated. Alice took out a small card. When she read it, she rolled her eyes and smiled. Arthur apologized for his rude words and invited her on a romantic date. At the bottom he signed, no refusal accepted. Alice looked at herself in the mirror. It would be nice to go home and change. She sighed heavily. I wish I'd worn my new dress today. It was already past 8 o'clock, and Alice still hadn't gotten off work. After standing there for another 30 minutes, Arthur realized that she was just playing on his nerves. It's like she's messing with me on purpose, he said aloud, nervously drumming his fingers on the steering wheel. He couldn't take it anymore, so he pulled out his cell phone and dialed her number. Hello? Alice, I'm waiting for you. Trying not to show his irritation, said Arthur. Arthur, sorry, I forgot to warn you. Today will not work out. Why not? Because we are now accepting the goods. And how long will it take? About an hour, maybe longer. I'll wait, Arthur answered categorically. Alice didn't answer anything, just dropped the call. Arthur took another cigarette out of the pack, got out of the car and smoked. After standing for another hour, he finally saw Alice. He quickly jumped out of the car and went towards her. She was staring at her phone not paying attention to the others and not seeing anything around her. Arthur took two steps towards her and Alice stared right at him. Something interesting. Arthur took her by the shoulders and looked intently into her eyes. I already thought, sinfully, that you do not want to see me, offended by me. Maybe I was offended, she said tiredly. That's what I thought. I sometimes have a mind separate from my body. Forgive me for my shameless tongue. I saw the basket with flowers, almost lost my mind from wild jealousy. Let's go. Arthur took a deep breath, buried his nose in her hair. Where to? We need to talk. Arthur smiled. Alice had been looking forward to this meeting. She was curious to find out why Arthur had become active again. For two months, he'd been silent. There hadn't been even the tiniest of attempts on her part. She never dreamed they'd meet again. About what? She tried to make her voice sound indifferent. Come on, you'll find out. Arthur took her hand. He opened the passenger door, carefully fastened her seatbelt. They drove just two blocks. Arthur had trouble finding a parking space. Turned off the engine. They went into a cozy cafe. Arthur ordered. Once they were alone, he put his hand over hers. I understand you're doing well. Working. Lots of admirers. Arthur, what admirers? What are you talking about? First time I've ever been given a bouquet. Thank you for the flowers, by the way. She took her hand away. Alice, stop sulking. Come back, he said in a hoarse voice. No, Arthur. I'm not coming back. Why not? You have such a temper. Anything that's not your way, you don't think straight. You don't weigh up the pros and cons. You start waving your saber around. Alice gave him a sad look. I'm ready to make amends, and you're going to help me do it. Arthur said with an air of importance. I'm afraid I don't have the strength. Alice grinned bitterly. But you try. I already tried. Nothing worked. She lowered her eyes. It was hard and even almost impossible to withstand Arthur's gaze. I'm not letting you go anywhere else. Stop testing my mettle, Arthur said. Alice waved her index finger at him, her cheeks reddened with irritation and righteous anger. It turns out if I want to kick out, I want to call back. No, Arthur, this will not happen. I will not come back to you and that's it. Arthur froze. He absolutely did not expect to hear such words from docile and once modest Alice. Alice, we made a scandal out of nothing. Think about it. 
because nothing terrible happened. I did not cheat on you and I'm not going to cheat in the future. Is it so difficult to forget all the offenses, forgive and enjoy life with a loved one? I'm just sure that we are made for each other. Arthur, no, I'm not changing my mind. I believed you once. And I think that only fools and dead people don't change their opinion. Everyone makes mistakes. It's a reason to reconsider your views and principles. Arthur decided to shine his wit. And I ask you to come to the store only for shopping. Snarky Alice. Then I will have to completely change my closet. He smiled. Arthur, take me home, please. Suddenly asked Alice. Whatever you say, darling. Arthur paid the waiter, carefully took her under his elbow, and led her out. Where are you taking me? Flapping her eyelashes asked Alice. To my home. Without taking his eyes off the road, Arthur clarified. Stop this nonsense. I told you that I'm not coming back to you. She got mad. Let's watch a movie. I bought a new coffee maker. I'll make you coffee. Calmly continued Arthur. Stop the car. Arthur pulled the car over. He turned to Alice, ran his fingers along her cheekbones, moved his hand to her knee. Get your hands off me. She shoved his hand away. Take me home. Where am I taking you? We're going home. He continued to explain. How could I ever believe you again? I hate you. From hate to love, it's one step. After saying that, he covered her lips with his. From an excruciatingly caressing and intoxicating kiss, all rational thoughts instantly flew out of her head. Arthur, please, she whispered quietly, trying to regain her breath. Only after you show me how much you hate me, he said, covering her lips again with a passionate kiss. Alice couldn't help herself. A hot wave of desire spilled over her whole body. She began to breathe hard. God, how she wanted to return to the time when they were together. Giving in to a lightning impulse, Alice pressed herself even harder against Arthur. His kiss became even deeper and more desirable. Alice had not planned to allow any liberties and bodily contact, but being in his arms, as if bewitched, gave in to his caresses. As if mesmerized, Alice enjoyed and responded to his hot kisses. At this moment, she wanted to spit on his pride, close his eyes to his offenses, wave goodbye, to say yes. But despite the burning desire to stay with this dear man, Alice found the strength to tear herself away from Arthur, who took the opportunity to take her in his arms. Arthur, let go please. I need to go home. Unnaturally quiet, almost a whisper, said Alice, trying to get out of this cleaning hands. He ignored her attempts. Arthur reached for her again, trying to kiss her, but Alice, this time, deftly shoved him away and turned her face away. Arthur, please stop. Show some respect. She felt his muscles tense. A wry grin appeared on his face. No, honey, I'm not letting you go anywhere. So qualitatively and culturally take out the brain and at the same time do not feel any remorse. May only you. Alice thought for a moment. He thinks he came, gave flowers. He's got his head up his ass and I'm supposed to step into his shoes. Forget everything at once, forgive him. Pretend that nothing supernatural has happened. What do you mean I won't let go? I feel like we broke up a long time ago. I left and I'm not coming back. She brought him back to reality. I feel that you are far from indifferent, Arthur replied in a hoarse voice. It was a momentary weakness. No more, she instantly clarified. Alice, I was wrong. I realize I repent. I understand that very much offended you. I have already asked your forgiveness countless times. If you want, I can ask you many, many more times. It's not hard for me to do. Don't, don't do anything. Just take me home. If you don't, I won't believe a word you say. Arthur pulled away, looked at Alice with a displeased look. He sighed heavily. At first, she thought he wouldn't let her go. He would forcefully bring her home and do what they both wanted. But Arthur gritted his teeth. He held back started the engine, turned the corner and drove in silence. Thank you. Alice jumped out of the car like a scalded woman. I'll walk her out. Arthur muttered grudgingly. Having lost all hope of putting Alice to bed that night, Arthur followed her with a disgruntled look. If you think I'm going to stop there, you're sorely mistaken. I'll meet you again tomorrow. I'll follow you around until you agree to come back. Don't waste your precious time. Those words have ruined Arthur's already bad mood. I bet in a week, two weeks tops. 
You'll be making me coffee in the morning, frying eggs and bacon and making hot sandwiches. He pressed Alice's back against the front door. He leaned in and kissed her again. I'll see you tomorrow. What about tomorrow? And tomorrow I meet you again. We have dinner. We go for a walk. I try to take you to my house again. That will be every day until you eventually agree. Arthur kissed her again on the lips. Alice closed her eyes, feeling with every cell of her body that here in his strong arms, she felt as if she had returned to her native and familiar father's house. Arthur was right after all. Two weeks later, Alice packed her things and moved in with Arthur, having taken a promise from him, never to accuse or make her feel guilty, to be respectful, trusting, and not jealous. Well, darling, congratulations. You're a student now. I wish you successful sessions, good grades, adequate teachers. Arthur, from the bottom of his heart, congratulated Alice on entering the university on a correspondence course. Today, we're going to celebrate your enrollment. Pick a restaurant. I am the sponsor. Solemnly announced Arthur, gently kissing her on the cheek. I don't want to go anywhere. Alice wrinkled her face. What's with the mood? Olivia told me she was expecting a call. Arthur tried to cheer up and cheer up his beloved. Let's order your favorite Italian cuisine. From his words, Alice covered her mouth with her hand and ran to the bathroom. Arthur made a surprised face and followed her, a little breathless, after a little pleasant procedure. After rinsing her mouth with water, Alice sank to the floor, right in the bathroom, put her head on her knees and closed her eyes. Is there anything you want to tell me? Arthur broke the silence. Justified to him for his condition, there was no desire and strength. Alice was still slightly nauseous and her mood was at zero. It was most likely something poison. Alice frantically began to remember what she had eaten for breakfast today. Did you feel all right yesterday? Arthur asked cautiously. He held out his hand and helped her up from the cold tile. It was probably just something I ate. Don't we have any tests in the medicine cabinet? Arthur asked, even though he knew the obvious answer. Why not? Alice wrinkled her face and shook her head. Maybe, you. Arthur didn't say the word pregnant out loud. Stop it. It's not funny. Alice walked out of the bathroom. She didn't feel like talking to Arthur at all. So what should I do? Make a reservation at the restaurant. If you're not feeling well, can we reschedule for tomorrow? I don't want anything. Alice closed her eyes. Let's reschedule for tomorrow. Whatever you say, dear. I'll be there soon. I have to go out. Arthur warned her. He quickly got ready and left the apartment. He walked briskly to the pharmacy. He bought several different tests at once, thanked the pharmacist for the consultation and returned home. Alice, take a test just in case. What the hell is not kidding? Maybe you're pregnant. Arthur put several different boxes in front of her. And if the result is confirmed, she looked at Arthur questioningly. Let's find out the result first. I'm warning you, I won't have an abortion. If anything, I will raise my child myself. Arthur grinned. She'll raise it herself. She's grown up and independent. He sank into the chair. Alice got up, took the test and closed herself in the bathroom. Arthur stared at one point. He had no energy to wait for Alice. His whole life had flashed before his eyes in those few minutes. How had I lived before? For what, for whom? Always running, always running, always striving for something trying to prove to people that I was still capable of something. A restaurant, whores, girlfriends like Elizabeth, and everything suited me, until Aliska came into my life. Arthur turned his gaze to Alice's pale face. There was silence in the room. For a few seconds, they just stared at each other. I'm pregnant. Alice barely squeezed out of herself and handed Arthur the test, which showed two clear stripes. You mean I'm going to be a father soon? Aren't you excited? It seemed like one more second and she would explode like an atomic bomb. Alice watched his reaction carefully, trying to understand his mood, but she couldn't read anything on Arthur's face. Arthur, I repeat, I will not have an abortion. Say something. Aren't you happy? I can't imagine myself as a parent, but I'm glad. I really am. I am. You are. Of course you are. Arthur hugged Alice and kissed the top of her head. Thank you. I love you. I wanted to surprise you tonight, but I can't wait till tonight. Arthur picked up his purse, the same one that got him punched in the head by Thomas. He opened the lock, took out a red velvet box. 
He opened it and handed it to Alice. What's this? A ring. Arthur, you're... Did I get that right? That's right. Marry me. Alice bit her lip, barely holding back tears. Arthur, you're proposing to me? I don't believe it. She threw herself around his neck. All I have to do is get down on one knee. Do you want to? I do. I really do. Arthur took her hands away and got down on one knee. Alice, marry me, he said in a serious tone. I will. Arthur put a ring on her finger. When at the ultrasound, the doctor announced the sex of the baby and said that they will have a son. Arthur was glowing with happiness. A son. Dreamily, he said, gently stroking Alice's tummy. Now, Myron is already three years old. According to Arthur, the son inherited the intelligence and beauty of his father, but stubborn character of his precious mother. When Arthur first took Myron in his arms, he took a long, hard look at him. A happy smile never left his face. Arthur could not believe that finally at 32 years old, became a father of such a wonderful son. Then he went to Alice, kissed her. Thank you, my love, for your son. He is so beautiful. And Alice almost burst into tears with happiness. To meet Alice from the maternity hospital came her sister with her husband and two nephews. The sister was so happy and joyful. She was constantly wiping away her tears. She praised Alice and couldn't get enough of Myron. She smiled at Arthur and was always thankful for her sister. Elizabeth sent a message. She congratulated Alice on the birth of her son. She asked her to forgive her again. She said she wanted to come to the discharge, but she was afraid Alice would lose her milk if she saw her, and she couldn't let that happen. I should have gone to VGIK to the acting department. I would have been the best student there. It is necessary to have a certain talent. Kevin praised himself and smiled, but today, Kevin was waiting for a complete fiasco at home. Maria was sitting on the sofa with a lost look and tears were rolling from her eyes. Maria, honey, what's wrong? Concerned about her condition, Kevin jumped to her. He knelt down in front of her and began to gently wipe away her tears. Tell me, sweetheart, who hurt you? I had Tracy's laminating appointment today. Her phone was on the table. She got a message from you. You consulted her on the best date to take tickets to Egypt. Maria carefully watched her husband's reaction. Honey, you've definitely got me confused with someone else. Kevin started making excuses and glancing warily at his wife. No, I didn't. Maria didn't let him finish, but interrupted him. I grabbed your mistress by the hair and threatened her. If she doesn't tell me the truth, I'll cut out a piece of her hair in the most visible place. She confessed everything, Kevin. Maria raised her eyes full of tears to her husband. Let me go. Tracy screamed. I don't have anything to do with this. Deal with your husband. He doesn't let a single skirt pass him by. I went to the gym and I saw him licking his lips at me. I didn't know he was married. Maria let go of her hair, which she wound around her arm in anger. You're crazy. You need treatment. Almost crying, Tracy said. You would be better to your husband so grabbed by the hair. Maybe he would be less walking from you. Maria went home. First of all, she opened the safe and took out all the cash they had saved for the development of their business. She took John to his mother beforehand so that he would not ask any questions. Maria took her time gathering all the necessary things into a suitcase and rolled it out into the hallway. When she heard the door lock rattle, she sat down on the sofa, put her leg over her leg and waited impatiently for her husband. Maria saw Kevin's eyes widen when she told him about the conversation with his mistress and when she told him that she almost lost her hair. Kevin choked on his own saliva and coughed as if it was happening to him. He touched his hair to make sure and calmed down when he realized that it was in place. Maria put the strap from her purse on her shoulder, took the handle of the suitcase and slowly rolled it to the door. I'm leaving you, Kevin. I should have done it a long time ago, but I was naive and trusted you to be decent. But thanks to Tracy, she's opened my eyes to a lot of things. When you see her again, tell her I said hello and thank her for taking the rose-colored glasses off my eyes. Kevin stared at her with a blank stare, wanting to justify himself to his wife, because he had always been good at messing with her mind, but now he couldn't think of a single good idea to get out of this unpleasant story. I wonder what else Tracy could have said. She couldn't have told me that we tried every position in the Kama Sutra, could she? Kevin grimaced. 
For the first time in his life, he was suddenly disgusted and almost vomited at the memory. Maria, honey, you've got it all wrong. Keevan started talking and stammering in fear. He imagined that now his good and decent Maria would leave him, and who would he be left with? No, sorry, sorry, he was not ready to lose his wife. Keevan knelt down in front of his wife, wrapped his arms around her waist and looked into her eyes as pitifully as possible. Maria, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's the first time I've had such a thing. I don't need anyone but you and John. Don't leave me. Do you want me to call this Tracy and tell her that it's over between us? I'll tell her that I need her as a dog's fifth lay. Maria disdainfully removed his hands. Don't bother, Kevin. You don't have to make that kind of sacrifice. You'll lose your tickets to Egypt and your five-star hotel. Kevin, you've always been good with money. I can't call you a spender. Remember how you sent me to the cottage to my mother and son every summer because we could not afford foreign trips. Kevin's heart snapped and squeezed into a ball of shame in front of his wife. Only yesterday, they talked to her on this topic, and he assured her that next year, they will definitely find the money for a vacation. Maria, we can't do it this year. We'll have to be patient. Kevin squeezed his eyes shut and lowered his head, remembering his words. Maria looked at him disappointedly, holding back her tears. I don't know what came over me. I treat girls like Tracy as sports equipment to be used as intended. And nothing more. And nothing more. Don't go, Maria. Please don't go. Kevin stopped at the end of the gym, on the treadmill. A sultry brunette with a solid size three breasts and a tattoo on her shoulder was hard at work. Kevin slowly ran his palm over his three-day stubble and signaled her to stop. That's enough. Let's move on to another projectile. Kevin did not let on that the girl was interested in him and together with her went to the apparatus. For a man spoiled by women's attention, with a height of five feet, narrow waist, broad shoulders and cubes on his chest, it did not escape him that the girl was also interested in him and sent him unmistakable languorous looks. While Tracy, swaying her hips, went to the apparatus, Kevin was looking at her form with an appraising eye. He paid special attention to her long legs, her appetizing fifth point and the hollow between her breasts. Her behavior spoke for itself. Take me, I'm all yours. Keevan considered himself a well-mannered young man and was not accustomed to refusing a lady if she insisted on continuing. At about 10 o'clock in the evening, after a tiring workout, with all its consequences, Kevin sent Tracy home in a cab, and he was barely able to get to his car to go home. Wow, it's half past 11. He had to hurry so his wife wouldn't guess anything and start asking questions he couldn't answer. As he stepped out of the elevator, Kevin smelled the food coming from his apartment. Maria, I'm here. Why isn't anyone here to greet me? His wife ran out into the hallway, hugged him, kissed him gently on the cheek and pressed herself against his chest. What took so long? I was getting worried. Maria looked at him with her trusting eyes and pouted her chubby lips resentfully. Honey, you don't know how tired I am of these fattened women who want to be as slim as a dove in one session. But for the sake of you and John, I have to put up with it and take extra workouts. He grinned and shrugged. You're the breadwinner. Maria kissed him softly on the lips. Go wash your hands, I'll feed you. And what does it smell so good? The smell of it makes me sick to my stomach and drool. Kevin asked and went to wash his hands. Kevin put the foam on the kitchen table and started dinner. Oh, not this. Kevin guessed it was Tracy sending him a message. He grabbed the phone and turned it off defiantly. They'd gotten so cocky they didn't even look at the time. I warned them not to call after 10 o'clock because I have a small child. Kevin was so sincerely indignant that he believed he was telling the truth. After a delicious dinner, Kevin drank a glass of freshly squeezed juice and leaned back in his chair, contentedly remembering everything that he and Tracy had done tonight. Kevin sighed heavily he would give anything to be in the lounge with her again. But in the bedroom, his wife was waiting for him, who had long since stopped playing games with him. Kevin's mood immediately soured, and while his wife went to the nursery to check on her son, he grabbed his phone and started texting Tracy. In the morning, Kevin woke up to the delicious smell of scrambled eggs and bacon. He stretched out in bed, got up, did 30 push-ups from the floor and walked out of the bedroom to find himself face to face with Maria, who was on her way to call him for breakfast. Maria's phone rang. Yes, just a minute. 
Let me see what time I can get you in. It's 1.20. Great. Then I'll book you in. Tracy, just Tracy. I'll see you all tomorrow for your hair coloring. When Kevin heard his lover's name, he froze with bacon in his mouth and almost spilled hot coffee on his hand. He called Tracy in the car. Hi. She murmured languidly. Miss me already? Tracy continued to purr softly. Tracy, why did you make an appointment with my wife to get your hair done? I'm asking you not to do that. He mumbled unhappily into the phone. There was silence for a while. Kevin, I didn't know it was your wife. A friend gave me the phone number of this guy. I called him on a tip. It's nothing personal. You're gonna have to sign up with another guy. Kevin started to insist. Tracy thought about it for a while and spoke softly. I'd be very interested in meeting the wife of such a hot macho man. After a few seconds of thinking, Kevin angrily hung up the phone, hit the gas and drove to work. Tracy had Kevin in her clutches. Every evening she came to the gym and after a personal training session, squeezed all the juices out of him. Kevin came home late, moving slowly because of the traffic and a lot of traffic. He was in a great mood. Today, he and Tracy had decided to go on vacation for a week to get away from the hustle and bustle of the world and enjoy each other. He had already thought of what he would tell his wife. He would go to school for a week for her. It was unlikely that Maria would suspect him of lying because Kevin had never given his wife any reason to doubt his infidelity. For her, he was always a good and faithful family man. Kevin grinned wryly. I'll make it up to you, I promise you. At least for the sake of my son, Let's try to keep the family. Maria grinned bitterly and in order not to burst into tears and not to show her weakness, she walked around him and went out the door. I won't let you go. I'll fix everything. If you want, I'll even quit this job and find another one. Kevin shouted at the whole building, grabbed her elbow and to hold her, began to pull her back into the apartment. Maria disdainfully pulled her elbow and shoved him away from her. No. She shook her head and grabbed the handle of her suitcase. Forget about the happy family we had. In our family behind the happy mask, hit lies, deceit, and betrayal on your part. I do not want to live like that. I cannot live with a man who does not love and respect me. Maria thought a little and continued. And you know, I will definitely find a man who will love me and will not laugh behind my back. Maria brushed a tear off her cheek and looking intently at Kevin point blank, she continued. And I wish you good luck. Now you don't have to hide and wiggle around like a frying pan. You'll live the life you want, even though you've never denied yourself anything. Goodbye. I'll let you know the date of the divorce. She said and got in the elevator. What an asshole. What an asshole. A lecherous bastard who indiscriminately sticks his junk in anything that moves. Cousin Sophia was cursing when she saw Maria with a suitcase on the doorstep. And this is a married man with a growing son. You didn't accidentally hit him with a frying pan before you left, did you? No. Maria smiled bitterly. You should have. Shouted Sophia. Maria covered her face with her hands and sobbed bitterly. Calm down. Sophia said in a calmer tone, sighed and stroked her sister's head. He is not worth your tears. Tomorrow go and file the divorce papers. Maria wiped her eyes red from tears blew her nose and nodded her head. Sophia, I'll stay at your place for now. I don't want to stay with my mom. Her brother and his wife live there now. I want to rent an apartment. As soon as I rent an apartment, I'll move out of your place. Well, not to kick you out on the street. Her sister said sympathetically and shook her head. Now let your Kevin bite his elbows, where else he will find such a dushka to iron his socks and panties from both sides and put a sock in his pocket and maybe he will even be happy to divorce. Maria said thoughtfully, looked at Sophia, and smiled bitterly. Now I won't have to lie about why he was late at work and worry that I'll get into his phone, with which he never leaves. He will hire a housekeeper who will wash, iron, cook, and clean, sadly said Maria. So the housekeeper has to pay for everything, and you did everything for free. With a chuckle in her voice commented on Maria's words, Sophia. There will be less money left for different whoremongers. She continued. Don't take offense, Maria, but it's all your own fault. You're working too much at work, and then you run to the kitchen to cook chops for Kevin. And Kevin gets tired. He takes overtime. 
Now you finally realize what kind of overtime he had. While you were carrying bags of groceries from the supermarket to feed Kevin better, he was practicing new poses with different fucks on the equipment. Sophia sighed heavily. Come on, I'll make you some tea. I have borscht in the fridge, but I don't even offer it. I can see that you can't eat a bite now. Maria sobbed and brushed a tear from her cheek again. You're right, Sophia. She spoiled him, looked into his mouth and blew dust off him, so he felt like Apollo. Maria said barely audibly and looked at her sister in surprise, because at that moment the front door bell rang. Are you waiting for someone? Maria said in a frightened voice and rounded her eyes in fear. Who are you scared of? Do you think Kevin has already come for you? Don't be fooled, sister. Sophia put the mug with tea on the table and went to open the door. Maria held her breath and hid behind the curtain just in case. Maria, where are you? Come out of your hiding place. What the hell kind of wife am I to you if you're going on vacation tomorrow with your mistress? Maria screamed. Maria, we need to talk to you urgently. Kevin said loudly, stammering in surprise. What can we talk to you about? She crossed her arms over her chest and leaned back against the wall, her whole body trembling with excitement, but she tried to look calm and not to show it. Maria, what right did you have to take all the money out of the safe? Give back at least half of it. Without preamble, Kevin looked at his wife pleadingly. Not enough money for the trip. Didn't get paid enough for overtime? You can make it up as you wish. You've already spent your half of the money. I took my half. Now get out. Maria pointed at the door. Maria, let's talk to you alone, without strangers. He turned his head and looked defiantly at Sophia, who looked at him with undisguised contempt from head to toe. You and I are adults, so why did we need third parties? Kevin kept his angry gaze on Sophia, showing her that she was unnecessary. Let's discuss our future life and find the best way out of this situation. He continued talking, ignoring the laughter. Our future life. Maria repeated his words in surprise. Do you know what you're saying? We are no more, Kevin, and there will never be any more. There is you, your work, your girls with whom you hold masterclasses, and I am not in your life, and never was. Maria smiled sadly and sighed heavily. Maria, if you now tell me to refuse a trip to Egypt, I'll throw away the ticket and stay home with you. I, your peace of mind and the health of my son, are more important to me than anything else. Kevin went on with his prepared speech justifying himself and his actions. Do you really think that I would trade you and my son for some other woman who would jump into my bed at the first call? Kevin wrinkled his face and clenched his hands into fists. It's even funny. Looking at his wife with a guilty look, he continued his speech. Why do you need money if you're not going to Egypt? Sophia asked with a sneer. You're the only one who is missing here with your stupid questions. Kevin thought to himself and turned his gaze to her. Sophia, can I talk to my wife? Sophia raised her eyebrows in surprise, shook her head and continued. Marie should have left you a long time ago. Maybe long ago forgot you and would not remember as a terrible dream. Or did you decide to take your wife to rest with you instead of a mistress? Kevin did not expect such a question and began to frantically search for all kinds of solutions in his head. Going on vacation with his wife wouldn't be desirable, of course. You can't relax with Maria like you can with Tracy. And Tracy won't give up her vacation. She sleeps and sees herself in Egypt. I'd love to go with you, Maria. He began to speak uncertainly, carefully choosing words, thinking how to get out of this situation. But airplane tickets are non-refundable. You can't change them. He smiled guiltily and pressed his lips together in a tight line. Sophia laughed and clapped her hand on her leg, which was to be expected. I was checking you out, Kevin, and you didn't pass, of course. Maria, should I stay or should I go? She asked her sister a question, ignoring Kevin. Sophia, don't go. I have nothing else to talk to him about. What do you mean there's nothing else to talk about? Have you lost your mind, Maria? We have a family, a child, if you've remembered. What? You're gonna ruin it all over one ridiculous affair. Have you thought about your son? Maria watched her husband's frustration and wondered how she had noticed his insolence and endless lies before. Maria laughed and clapped her hands together. Kevin, I always told you that you chose the wrong profession. 
You would have made a great artist if you had entered the theater. Go away, Kevin. I filed for divorce. You're about to get a sapuna. Kevin's face changed immediately. Red as a tomato, his eyes rounded, a vein of anger rising above his eyebrow. You filed for divorce? Are you all right in the head? Did your little sister put you up to this? She's living without a man and she's setting you up. And you're all ears. She filed for divorce. Kevin mocked her. You couldn't think of anything cleverer. He stared at Maria and watched her every gesture, trying to understand her mood for the future. He noted to himself that she had turned from soft and docile to rebellious. Thanks to that crazy sister who was turning Maria against me. Maria, let's go home. I miss you. It's a neighbor brought a debt. She grabbed some money from me before the paycheck. And you hid behind the curtain you think you cannot see? Sophia laughed heartily. I didn't even have time to think about anything. I just jumped up and hid behind the curtain out of fear. Smiling, began to justify Maria, embarrassed by her action. Who are you afraid of? What can he do to you? Do you think he will come and beg to come back? Sophia laughed again and looked at Maria judgmentally. Yes, I think he already invited Tracy and practiced new exercises on your bed. While you snot on your fist and wait for him to apologize. Sophia wrinkled her face and continued to teach her sister. I didn't like him right away. As soon as I saw him for the first time, all so correct, obliging. I didn't say anything to you then. I didn't want to upset you. But I warned him that if he let his hands loose again, I'd tell you everything. I remember how his face stretched at my threats. He looked at me like I was begging, and before anyone saw him, he twisted his finger at my temple. Sophia shook her head and curled her lips disdainfully. What a nasty and unpleasant man he was. Sophia shrugged and crinkled her shoulders like a toothache. It hadn't even been five years, and he'd already shown his true colors. Sophia sighed and looked at her sister, who sat demurely in her chair, rubbing her fingers together. After drinking a bottle of whiskey, Kevin stared at his phone, which was on the table, ringing persistently. He was in no condition to talk to Tracy at the moment. Kevin had texted her right after Maria had left, telling her that she was the reason his wife had left him and thanking her for sticking her nose where it didn't belong and talking with her tongue wherever and whenever she could. Kevin put the phone on silent mode and barely moving his feet, went to the son's room, stood in the doorway for a while, thinking that his son might not be in this room ever again, and Mary would not meet him on the doorstep, would not throw herself on his neck with joy. Kevin had tears in his eyes, and his heart was beating such a drumbeat. He felt so sorry for himself that he collapsed on the children's bed. He buried his face in the pillow and gritted his teeth with heartache. Kevin woke up to the persistent ringing of the doorbell. Tracy stood on the doorstep smiling with all her 32 teeth. You're the last thing I need right now. Kevin thought to himself and stepped away from the door, letting her into the apartment. I had to get the address from your boss. I didn't like your mood last night. If you do anything else to yourself, we're going on vacation in two days. Tracy went into the hall and jumped on the couch. When she saw that Kevin didn't react to her at all, she stood up, put her arm around his shoulders, pushed him down, and they fell on the couch together. Tracy began to unzip her dress, looking flirtatiously at Kevin and licking her lips with her tongue. Tracy, I'm not in the mood today. Kevin screwed up his face and started to get up off the couch. Where did your mood go? Are you really that upset about your mentally ill wife? You should be glad she left you. You probably wouldn't have made such a desperate move yourself. Tracy slowly looked around the room. It's cozy in here, she said, taking off her dress and wearing only lace underwear. She waved her index finger at Kevin, smiling coquettishly with her charming smile. His eyes lit up at once. He picked Tracy up in his arms and carried her to the marital bedroom. Maria was calling another realtor when Sophia came into her room. Why are you running ahead of the train? You're in a hurry. I'm not chasing you. Sophia began to reprimand her. You'll divorce your Kevin, divide your movable and immovable property. Buy yourself an apartment and then you'll leave me. And now live at my place with John and I will not be bored. Maria looked at her sister with approval. Thank you, sis. Maria sighed and looked sadly at Sophia. She looked as if she was being led to the days for the death penalty. The sound of the front doorbell interrupted their conversation. 
Sophia went to open the door. Get my wife, I need her right away. Without any preamble, Kevin said angrily and started pushing Sophia out of the way to get into the apartment. Hello to you two. I didn't invite you to visit. Sophia started to push him away and tried to close the door, but Kevin put his foot out so she couldn't slam it shut. Where's my wife again? He said it loud and clear. I'm calling the police. Sophia shouted as she continued to try to close the door. Let me go. He pushed Sophia away, went into the apartment and slammed the door behind him. Maria heard Kevin's voice and rushed to Sophia's aid. What are you doing? Now he's going to start feeling sorry for her. You can't tell a kid that his dad is full of shit and that it's better to stay away from him and have nothing to do with him. Sophia thought to herself and grabbed the keys to the apartment and ran downstairs. As soon as Kevin saw his son, he jumped out of the car and ran to him. Daddy! John exclaimed joyfully and jerked in his direction, but Sophia held his nephew's hand tightly and did not let go. Kevin jumped to the son, grabbed him in his arms and held him tightly to his chest. Hi son, I missed you John. Did you miss your daddy? Kevin looked down at his son's face. John shook his head and hugged his father tightly around the neck. John let's go home, mom is waiting for us, she missed you so much. John turned his head to Sophia and only opened his mouth to answer, but saw Maria, who ran out of the building and stretched out her arms to her son. John immediately starts kicking to be released by his father, and all his attention turns to Maria. He jumps into his mother's arms and hugs her tightly around the neck. Maria kisses her son first on one cheek, then on the other, begins to twirl him around and only then puts him on the ground. Let's go home. She says with a satisfied smile and takes John's hand. John doesn't think long and takes his father's hand with his other hand. Daddy's not coming with us, John. Daddy will come to you later. Maria says affectionately, but she looks at Kevin and shows him to leave with her eyes. But Kevin pretends not to notice his wife's hints and confidently pulls his son to the driveway. Kevin, where are you going? We've already talked to you and made up our minds. Let's not get into it in front of the baby. She looks at him with a disapproving tone, sparks shooting from her eyes. Maria, I miss my son too. Why do you have to decide everything for us? You see how happy John is to see me. And you want to deprive him of that joy. Kevin looked at Maria with the eyes of a battered dog looking for protection from its master, then slowly turned his gaze to Sophia. Sophia, please tell your sister not to throw words around but to think with her own head. It's easy to ruin everything. Look at your sister. He turned to Maria. She's a year older than you, and she's alone. You think it's easy to live alone? No husband, no kids? Kevin knelt down on his knees in front of Maria. The presence of a big puddle outside the building and two old ladies staring at them did not embarrass him. Mary, dear, forgive me for being a fool. You've always supported me and pulled me out of the shit I've gotten myself into from time to time. Kevin started wailing. Maria, take your artist to the apartment. Sophia said grudgingly and opened the door with the intercom key. The neighbors are already staring at us, so let's not give them something to talk about. What an insolent and shameless man you are. Maria lamented after listening to her husband's heartwarming story. She widened her eyes and stammered and asked again. So you want me to give you the money, which diligently saved to rent a separate room and open a salon? Maria, but I also gave you my entire paycheck, Kevin sighed and sighed resentfully. No, there are no flaws in my Mary. Kevin thought with his hands on the steering wheel and looked around, hoping to see his wife and son. Kevin rehearsed again and again the words he would say to Marie when he met her. The phone rang. Kevin looked at the screen, made a sour face, but picked it up. Did you miss me? Tracy greeted him cheerfully. Are you thinking of flying to the pyramids with me tomorrow? Tracy made a small pause, but without waiting for an answer, continued. Actually, what I'm calling. I decided to write a report on you about rape or more precisely violent actions of sexual character. Kevin furrowed his eyebrows as he listened to her babble and shook his head in confusion, as if he'd heard something incomprehensible and supernatural. Are you all right in the head? There's no place to brand you and you're accusing me of something. Kevin's forehead was sweating and he clutched his head and swore out loud. What more do you want from me? He continued angrily shouting. 
money, Tracy answered calmly. I thought you'd come with me and take me on your full support, but since I'm going alone, I need a lot of money to have a good vacation and not deny myself anything. He even knew that she was bluffing, but with a good deal of money, he could go to jail. That's all I need. Keevan grimaced and slammed his hands on the steering wheel. Thank God she's of legal age. He cursed to himself as he thought of all the ways out of this ridiculous situation. The fact that she was with me was seen by everyone at the gym. She can find witnesses easily and maybe I'll win the case, but she'll get on my nerves. How much money do you want? Stuttering at her insolence, Kevin asked in a disgruntled tone. $5,000, I don't ask for much. It's moral damages for babysitting you all this time, believe me. It's a small amount compared to what I had to listen to from you. Tracy started laughing and her laughter made Kevin's eyes darken. He swallowed nervously and gritted his teeth in anger. Kevin, the money is needed today. Tracy said calmly. You realize that I'm leaving tomorrow and a spoonful is a spoonful. Kevin began to run through the names of people he knew who could get the money and he settled on his wife. I'll explain everything to her honestly. She should understand and forgive me. Kevin immediately pulled himself together and calmed down, praising himself for quickly finding a way out of the problem. You'll get your money. Kevin replied in a disgruntled tone and pressed the disconnect button. Kevin saw Maria. He jumped out of the car, took the bouquet in his hands and headed towards her. Maria, hi. He handed her the flowers and smiled guiltily. Maria, I'm here on business. We need to talk urgently. Kevin started talking without any preamble. Maria rounded her eyes and made a frightened face and answered, What's wrong with you again, Kevin? Maria, don't get me wrong. I need money, 5,000 bucks, pronto. And why did you come to me in the first place? Maria had a question mark on her face and a look of total indifference. Who else would I turn to if not my own wife? Kevin lowered his eyes in shame and made an unhappy face. Kevin, don't even think about it. You won't get the money. You've been stealing from me and my son all this time, and now you're going to steal the rest of the money I've taken. I'm sorry, but you're on your own, and I still have a son to raise. I don't have extra money for your toys. Categorically answered Maria, turned around, and without saying goodbye went into the building. Kevin remained standing on the street and looked at the door, behind which his wife had disappeared a few minutes ago. Maria stood at the window and watched Kevin. Why doesn't he leave? Is he still hoping for something? Does he think I'm a complete fool who is madly in love with him and would do anything for him? Safia appeared on the horizon, leading John by the hand. They had agreed this morning that Safia would finally take him away from his mother. Maria missed her son and was looking forward to seeing John. She watched slowly as they approached Kevin, who opened the side window and smoked in the car, carelessly shaking the ashes out into the street. No, there are no flaws in my Mary. Kevin thought with his hands on the steering wheel and looked around, hoping to see his wife and son. Kevin rehearsed again and again the words he would say to Marie when he met her. The phone rang. Kevin looked at the screen, made a sour face, but picked it up. Did you miss me? Tracy greeted him cheerfully. Are you thinking of flying to the pyramids with me tomorrow? Tracy made a small pause, but without waiting for an answer, continued. Actually, what I'm calling... I decided to write a report on you about rape or more precisely violent actions of sexual character. Kevin furrowed his eyebrows as he listened to her babble and shook his head in confusion, as if he'd heard something incomprehensible and supernatural. Are you all right in the head? There's no place to brand you and you're accusing me of something. Kevin's forehead was sweating and he clutched his head and swore out loud. What more do you want from me? He continued angrily shouting money. Tracy answered calmly. I thought you'd come with me and take me on your full support, but since I'm going alone, I need a lot of money to have a good vacation and not deny myself anything. He even knew that she was bluffing, but with a good deal of money, he could go to jail. That's all I need. Kevin grimaced and slammed his hands on the steering wheel. Thank God she's of legal age. He cursed to himself as he thought of all the ways out of this ridiculous situation. The fact that she was with me was seen by everyone at the gym. She can find witnesses easily, and maybe I'll win the case, but she'll get on my nerves. How much money do you want? 
stuttering at her insolence, Kevin asked in a disgruntled tone. $5,000, I don't ask for much. It's moral damages for babysitting you all this time, believe me. It's a small amount compared to what I had to listen to from you. Tracy started laughing and her laughter made Kevin's eyes darken. He swallowed nervously and gritted his teeth in anger. Kevin, the money is needed today. Tracy said calmly, you realize that I'm leaving tomorrow and a spoonful is a spoonful. Kevin began to run through the names of people he knew who could get the money and he settled on his wife. I'll explain everything to her honestly. She should understand and forgive me. Kevin immediately pulled himself together and calmed down, praising himself for quickly finding a way out of the problem. You'll get your money. Kevin replied in a disgruntled tone and pressed the disconnect button. Kevin saw Maria. He jumped out of the car, took the bouquet in his hands and headed towards her. Maria, hi. He handed her the flowers and smiled guiltily. Maria, I'm here on business. We need to talk urgently. Kevin started talking without any preamble. Maria rounded her eyes and made a frightened face and answered, What's wrong with you again, Kevin? Maria, don't get me wrong. I need money, 5,000 bucks, pronto. And why did you come to me in the first place? Maria had a question mark on her face and a look of total indifference. Who else would I turn to if not my own wife? Kevin lowered his eyes in shame and made an unhappy face. Kevin, don't even think about it. You won't get the money. You've been stealing from me and my son all this time, and now you're going to steal the rest of the money I've taken. I'm sorry, but you're on your own, and I still have a son to raise. I don't have extra money for your toys. Categorically answered Maria, turned around, and without saying goodbye went into the building. Kevin remained standing on the street and looked at the door, behind which his wife had disappeared a few minutes ago. Maria stood at the window and watched Kevin. Why doesn't he leave? Is he still hoping for something? Does he think I'm a complete fool who is madly in love with him and would do anything for him? Safia appeared on the horizon, leading John by the hand. They had agreed this morning that Safia would finally take him away from his mother. Maria missed her son and was looking forward to seeing John. She watched slowly as they approached Kevin, who opened the side window and smoked in the car, carelessly shaking the ashes out into the street. Kevin asked, sighing heavily and rising from his chair and looked at Maria point blank. No. She answered and shrugged her shoulders for credibility. Is that your last word? Squinting his eyes and pressing his lips together, Kevin asked again. Yes. Maria answered briefly. He grinned, threw a crumpled napkin on the table, and without saying goodbye, walked toward the front door. He turned his head sharply, looked angrily at Sophia, turned his gaze to Maria, and smiled sorely. You'll regret it. Get ready for war. In a few days, there was almost nothing left of the lustrous and cheerful Kevin. The excitement was gone from his eyes, a deep sadness was reflected on his face, and he was completely apathetic to the world around him. All my trouble started as soon as I met that little girl. Kevin closed his eyes and crinkled his teeth as if from a toothache, remembering how Tracy had threatened him and, to put it mildly, threatened him with the sky in a cage. There is nothing sacred in today's youth. She had fun and made money. Kevin was indignant when he dialed her number. Hello, darling. Tracy answered affectionately, and from this voice, Kevin was shaken as if by an electric shock. He could not answer her in the same way, but Kevin did answer, gathering all his will in a fist. We should get together. He mumbled angrily. Did you bring the money? Tracy asked and Kevin realized from her voice that she couldn't contain her laughter. Go outside, I'm standing under your window. Kevin said quickly and dropped the call. She's going to come out and shine like a polished mover. Kevin had gone to this friend's house and borrowed money from him before he came to see her, and now he was using the last words he had to say about his ex-lover. She's a little slut. I knew in my heart that I'd get in trouble with her. I fell for a beautiful shell, and now I'll regret it for the rest of my life. I hope you're smart enough to keep your mouth shut. Kevin sighed and pulled a piece of paper and a pen out of the glove compartment. What's that for? Tracy asked in a disgruntled tone and looked at Kevin with wide open eyes. It's a receipt, where you tell me that you won't bother me with your crazy ideas. Right, I. Name? When the receipt was ready, Kevin gave Tracy the money. 
Thanks, Kevin. You're not thinking of flying with me tomorrow. She weighed the bucks in his face. Otherwise, let's go have some grown-up fun together. She flirtatiously suggested it while she watched his reaction. No. He even said hesitantly, biting his lip, but then he pulled himself together and said firmly, Come on out. I don't have time for demagoguery. I've got a lot to do, and I'd like to never cross paths with you again. Never say never, Kevin. Tracy laughed and got out of the car. Maria got off work and decided to walk a little bit to the daycare center. And John's dad took him. What do you mean, dad took him? Maria rounded her eyes in surprise. The teacher slammed her eyelashes and began to explain excitedly. When your husband came into the locker room, John threw himself on his neck and screamed, Daddy, I had no idea not to give him the baby. Why didn't you call me? How could you give him the baby? I can't believe it. Shouting at the teacher, Maria. Well, you should have warned us first of all, who can and who can't take the child. The teacher, whose eyes were running and hands were trembling from fear, began to justify herself. Remember, what did he say to John? Where did he take him? Maria grabbed the teacher's elbow and stared at her. He was talking about some amusement park. Maria took out her phone and started frantically searching her contacts for her husband's number. She prayed to herself and clenched her hands into fists. She dialed her husband's number several times, then texted them several more times, but Kevin didn't answer. I'm going to the police to file a missing persons report. Maria texted him. A minute later, her phone rang and the incoming call was from Kevin. Where's John? Why did you take him out of daycare? Who asked you to? Maria shouted into the phone, not remembering herself from rage. Maria, what are you doing? Kevin laughed. Don't forget that John is my son and if anything, I have the same rights to him as you do. We're taking him for a walk, feeding the ducks, going on the Ferris wheel now. I didn't call you to distract you from important things. I wanted to spend time with my son. You said yourself that I don't spend enough time with him, so I decided to make up for it. Please bring him to Sophia right now. I'll be waiting for you on the bench near the entrance. Maria begged Kevin tearfully. Stop making a big deal out of it. Kevin laughed. Son, tell your mom not to worry. We haven't been on the swings yet. And we haven't ridden the steam train. The phone rang with John's happy voice. Mom, we're gonna go out with Daddy for a little while. John's son. But Maria didn't have time to finish. You, Maria, go home. I love him and I miss him. I'll bring him home later. Kevin hit reset. Maria wiped her tears, took a deep breath. Try not to bring him back. I'll smash you against the wall. Maria sat on the bench outside the building and waited for Kevin to bring her son. She mentally raised her hands to the sky and prayed. Maria didn't even notice her sister, who came and sat next to her. Sis, why are you sitting here? Where's John? She turned her head and looked carefully at the playground, but not seeing her nephew, Sophia looked around and slowly looked at her sister. Why are you so pale? What's wrong? Where's John? Sophia asked her questions and looked at her sister carefully, not understanding what was happening to her. Maria, please don't be silent. Say something. Sophia started to shake her by the shoulders. Kevin took John from the garden and now they are walking with him. They have a cultural program. Maria squeezed out of herself and began to wipe away the tears that rolled down her cheeks. What an asshole. Sophia scolded angrily. Does he think he can get you back with these methods? Maria covered her face with her hands and cried. Sophia, say something. Calm me down. Do you think he'll give me my son back? Sophia calmed her sister down for a long time. She gave various examples and arguments so that Maria didn't get herself worked up. It's too early to be alarmed. John's with his own father. He's not gonna hurt him. Kevin loves him. He's his own blood. She mentally spat over her left shoulder and knocked on the wooden bench to prevent a disaster. Maria, look, Kevin's car. Sophia grabbed her sister's elbow and they walked together to meet the car coming into the yard. Kevin parked the car slowly, unlocked the doors, rolled down the window on his side and smiled. Maria opened the back door and John happily fell right into her arms. Mom, Dad, and I fed the ducks. I fed them a whole bun. John was talking excitedly and excitedly. And we rode on the big wheel. I was scared, but I didn't cry.
I'm a man, and men don't cry. Maria listened to the son's story with a smile, gently stroked his head and occasionally moved her gaze to Kevin. Well done. Swallowing a lump in her throat, she barely managed to squeeze out of herself. Maria, why are you so pale? Have you been crying? Kevin asked her in surprise and stared into her tear-stained face. He stepped out, leaned on the hood of the car, put his hands in his pockets and shook his head. So that's what you think of me. He grinned and shrugged. And I've lived with this woman for five years. Could you really think? But Maria didn't pay attention to Kevin anymore. All her attention was focused on her son, who was jumping around near his father and telling his mom where they were with his dad and how delicious cotton candy was. Kevin was watching Maria's reaction with the look of a victorious warrior, crossing his arms on his chest. Kevin thought to himself, not taking his eyes off his wife, and reluctantly shifted his gaze to Sophia, who was watching him with undisguised disgust. Their gazes met. We must come up with a plan to eliminate this megastar. He grinned wryly at Sophia and winked playfully with one eye. But she rolled her eyes and turned away from him defiantly. Thank you, Kevin, for making John's day. But please be sure to let me know if you're picking up the kid from daycare. Can you imagine how I feel when I go to pick up my kid and he's gone? Considering you've never done this before. Maria picked John up in her arms. Say goodbye to daddy's son. We have to go home. You need to be fed, bathe. You don't have to feed him. We ordered pizza at the pizzeria, and he ate two slices. Kevin interrupted her, smiled and waved goodbye to his son. Maria opened her mouth and looked at her husband incredulously. What happened to you, Kevin? Why such a change in attitude towards her son? I don't recognize you. She shook her head as if she were not Kevin, but some alien creature that fulfills their son's every whim. I hope you haven't changed your mind about the divorce, Sophia asked her sister as they went to bed late at night. Of course not. Maria grinned and thought about it. I feel sorry for John though, because he loves his deadbeat dad. Maria sighed heavily. Come on, Sophia, let's go to sleep. I have to get up early tomorrow, my eyes are closing. I'm nervous today. Her head was spinning like a seesaw, thoughts that kept her awake. It will be necessary to explain to John why daddy will live apart from them. Good that Sophia does not strain and allow to live with her. At least do not have to spend money on rented housing. After the divorce, probably I can buy a small apartment, but I will have to take a loan. The mortgage is unlikely to approve me. Buy an apartment in my neighborhood so that the garden does not change. John just got used to the children and teachers with pleasure goes to the group. Maria took a deep breath. It's okay. I'm not the first one to divorce my husband. I will work, plus alimony Kevin will pay. We will not starve. Maria suddenly became afraid of his thoughts. She wiped away her tears with her hand. God help me, please. She whispered quietly with her lips and looked at her son sleeping sweetly next to her. Divorce, alimony, moving, court. What scary words. I never thought I would say them out loud and be alone to raise a child who was born in love and full harmony. Maria remembered how happy and proud Kevin was that he would have a son. He named him after his grandfather, whom he loved and respected very much. It was like a chainsaw went through my heart, cutting it into two halves, not giving a chance to cure it. Maria grinned again. I think my sudden departure is comparable for Kevin to the fact that at home at the same time out of order all appliances, iron, vacuum cleaner, electric stove. Maria again looked at her son covered him with a blanket and gently stroked his head with her hand. Nothing, son, we will get through it. Everything will be fine with you and even better than it was. I will try to do everything for you so that you do not need anything. Kevin opened the mailbox, right in his hands fell out a summons to the court. Crinkling his lips, he began to read the form. He walked home on wobbly legs and looked around the apartment disappointedly. The empty closet caught his eye and he looked at John's toys. He looked at the old shoes that were peacefully waiting for their turn in the trash with glassy, tear-stained eyes. In his head, he immediately turned on the calculator. How much money he had spent on this Tracy. You could not only buy new shoes for Marie. With this money, you could completely update her closet. How Kevin wanted to turn back the clock and become a model family man. No more cheating on his wife. 
cut all his mistresses out of his life and start over. What an asshole I am. Sighing, Kevin regretfully said to himself, looking at his reflection in the mirrored doors of the closet. He ran his hand through his short cropped hair, looked at the three-day stubble on his face. No, Maria, I'm not ready to let you go yet, don't even hope. This house needs a mistress. He looked at his reflection in the mirror again from all sides. If I were a woman, I would have married him without thinking. Kevin grinned, satisfied with his words. Kevin had always thought of Maria as a silly girl who could see nothing beyond her nose except pots and pans. Now she had grown up in his eyes into a stubborn woman who stood firmly on her feet and did not snot. Kevin was determined to bring his wife and son home, using all his tricks and manly wiles. Sitting in the car, he rehearsed the speech he would give his wife when he met her. He was distracted by a knock on the front window from his side. What has our mass entertainer come up with this time? With a smirk spoke Sophia, making a surprised face. Where are the flowers? He gave two bouquets and decided that was enough. She continued her speech, trying to bite him harder. Sophia, go where you're going. No one's been waiting for you for a long time. Men shy away from someone like you like an evil force. I think about it and draw conclusions, not turn Maria against me. Kevin grinned sorely and gave Sophia a cold, haughty look. At that moment, he saw Maria walking toward the car, holding John's hand. Kevin grabbed the summons and jumped out of the car. Dad, Kevin squatted down and held his son close to him. John closed his eyes and hugged his father's neck with childish naivety. Where are you taking me today? He asked his father and turned his head to get Maria's approval. Son, I need to talk to my mom today. We'll go to the park some other time. Go home with Aunt Sophia. Mom and I have a very important matter to settle. What's that? Kevin stared at Maria angrily as the door slammed behind his son. It's a sapuna. I told you I was filing for divorce, Kevin shrugged and calmly explained. Maria, let's settle things like adults. Why rush? Give me a chance, and you yourself will realize that I realized all my mistakes and made the appropriate conclusions. Do not cut off the shoulder. With a guilty look, he stretched out his hands, took her by the shoulders, and looked fondly into her eyes. Maria pulled his hands away. She grinned bitterly at his smooth-shaven face. That's out of the question, Kevin. Upset by his wife's categorical answer, Kevin drove to work, angry at the world around him. Dan you Maria. Kevin swore in the car and tapped his hand on the steering wheel in frustration. That's enough, I'm sick of being a good husband. No one would appreciate it anyway. I need to relax a little. After all, I have every right to do that. Kevin calmed himself, driving into the parking lot near the sports complex. At the reception, swaying her hips, a sultry brunette came up to him, shooting her eyes at his broad chest, cubes on his stomach, and what is located a little below. Tomo asked, Kevin, are you leaving already? You're wrong, I just got here. Looking at her with an appraising look from head to toe, Kevin answered, and with the look of a man who knows his own value, he walked casually into the locker room. I can't believe how insensitive people are. Calling early in the morning, Kevin swore through his sleep and with his eyes closed, he fumbled for the phone on the nightstand. Kevin, why aren't you answering the phone? I've been trying to call you all morning. He heard his wife's voice and cringed with a headache. He opened his eyes and looked at the clock, 12.45. Then he looked at the brunette who was sleeping peacefully beside him. Shit. Kevin cursed out loud and immediately grabbed his temples. What happened last night? Kevin, you can help me out today and pick up John from kindergarten. It's just that my client is going on vacation and tearfully asked me to do hair coloring and cutting. And Sophie is going to a friend's anniversary party. What anniversary, Maria? Kevin could barely get a headache out of his mouth. What are you listening to? I'm talking to you. Maria replied in an aggrieved tone. Can you pick up John today? Kevin got out of bed and ran his fingers through his hair. His temples ached so badly that hitting his head with a hammer would be a lot easier than enduring the abuse he'd taken this morning. Kevin tripped over an empty whiskey bottle, stepped on lacy underwear, kicked a dress that was in the way, and cursed. He made his way to the kitchen, poured a glass of water from the tap, and drank it greedily. What are you saying, Maria? He asked his wife, trying to understand what she wanted from him. I'm asking you. Can you pick up the kid from kindergarten tonight? 
take him for a walk until I'm free. Losing her temper, Maria repeated for the third time. Sure, honey, I'll do whatever you want. Keevan looked at the naked girl who had left the bedroom and put his index finger to his lips, signaling her to be silent. But the girl ignored his signs and asked loudly, Is there cold water in the fridge? Are you thirsty? Kevin, are you busy? Did I call at a bad time? After some thought, asked Maria. Maria, are you out of your mind? There's a movie on TV. Don't you have anything better to do? Kevin continued to grumble into the phone. Having finished the conversation, he sat down on the sofa and looking at the naked girl walking around the apartment, tried to remember the events of last night. In his head, there were pictures of him making love with this brunette right in the elevator. How she flirted with him at the gym. And then they decided to go to the sauna together. The memory of what they did in the sauna made Kevin's cheeks flush, his ears fall off, and his hair almost fall off. Blee. I promised myself I'd never fall for those pumped up asses and stupid painted heads again. I should have gotten drunk again. Kevin scolded himself with his last words and glanced at the girl who, without shame and conscience, was sprawled out on the couch in her mother's clothes. Come on, get up and go home. I have to pick up my kid from daycare soon. Kevin shook her shoulder, but she didn't react. You're deaf. Get up. The girl slowly looked at Kevin, smiled coquettishly. Kevin stared at her silicone breasts, looked at her tanned and firm body, but remembered his promise to his wife to pick up his son. He quickly pulled himself together and turned away. What time is it? Kevin, instead of answering, dialed the cab member and ordered a car. The cab will be here in 10 minutes. Kevin shouted and carelessly threw her address. He grumbled unhappily. At five o'clock in the evening, Kevin took his son from kindergarten and they went to the park to fulfill the planned cultural program. In the evening, satisfied John delightedly told Mary how much fun they had with his daddy and what the best daddy he has. The judge ruled they were given a month to reconcile. The delay may cool down the emotions of the spouses as the defendant intends to restore the relationship and the plaintiff has no serious arguments for separation from her husband. Satisfied. Maria looked unhappily at her husband, who shone like a polished copper nickel. You ask. Of course he is. You think only of yourself. A man has made a mistake. He repents. He's sorry for what he did. Why get a divorce? You need a ride? Kevin opened the front door and gave her a gentle nudge into the car. Get in. Get in. Get in. Don't be silly. Kevin smiled when he saw that Maria was a little confused and didn't know what to do. I'll just give you a friendly ride. We're not strangers to each other. Kevin said as friendly as possible and closed the door behind Maria. A minute later, they were driving through the streets of the city and talking about distracting topics. Wait, where are you taking me? Suddenly Maria frowned and looked at Kevin. Kevin did not take his eyes off the road, shrugged his shoulders and calmly said, What do you mean where? Did you forget the way home? I thought I'd remind you. We need to talk quietly and without strangers. At work you have clients and colleagues. At home Sophia, who always comes in with her jokes and unnecessary advice. I just want to talk to you in a quiet environment so that no one interferes with us. All right. Marita sighed and stared out the side window. Then I'll take some of John's things and toys. She said thoughtfully and smiled slightly. Maria entered the apartment. Her nose was immediately struck by the unfamiliar smell of expensive female perfume. The smell and the recent presence of another woman in the apartment, she sensed immediately, but modestly kept silent. She went into the kitchen, looked around it. She went into the children's room and began to put in a bag his favorite cars, which he often remembered and regretted that he left them at home. You see, Maria, you are not here and there is no comfort and warmth in the house. Sometimes I don't even want to come back here knowing that you and your son are not home. Kevin looked into her eyes as if he was looking for sympathy and understanding. He took her hands and pressed them to his chest. Let's go talk. You've calmed down a little bit, cooled off. Maybe we can find a mutual solution that will suit you and me. Maria carefully released her arms from his embrace and sighed heavily. Kevin, I've made up my mind. I'm not going to change my mind. Don't get your hopes up. She picked up the broken baby car and carried it to the trash can. When she opened the lid, she saw empty whiskey bottles, two used contraceptives for safe sex, 
and a torn red thong. You miss your wife and son pretty well. She snorted in disgust and threw the lid down. Kevin closed his eyes, mentally sent himself away, and slapped his hand to his forehead. What an asshole. How could I forget to put the trash in the container this morning? It's not mine. Kevin was outraged and began to think up an excuse. Don't bother making excuses. I don't believe a word you say. Maria waved her hand and hurried out of the kitchen. She sat down on the sofa, wrinkled her face and said in a disgruntled tone, I'm listening to you carefully. Everything Kevin had wanted to say had slipped out of his mind. He was looking for an excuse for his actions, but he didn't know what to say or how to get out of the situation. Christopher came to visit me yesterday. Kevin picked up a tattered cardboard card that John had made with his own hands in the garden. How did it get here? He asked himself a question and couldn't find an answer. His mind was all jumbled up, his thoughts were jumping from side to side, but not a single worthwhile excuse was in his head. Kevin panted like a steam engine and angrily plopped down on the chair next to him. He slapped his hand on the armrest and looked at Maria with glassy eyes. That's the kind of shit I am. Gesticulating vigorously with his hands, he began to justify himself. Maria gave him a cold stare and grinned again. It's good that you realize that. They were both silent, studying each other with penetrating stares and thinking about their own things. I have to go to work. I have a client coming in for a haircut. Maria stood up abruptly and grabbed a bag of toys for her son. You won't even talk to me. You're so disgusted with me. Kevin squinted his eyes and continued to glare at Maria with his guilty look. The next minute he jumped up from his chair and blocked Maria's way. I won't let you in. He shouted and shook his head a few more times for credibility. Kiss me, then I'll think about it. Are you crazy? I'm not going to kiss you. Don't even dream about it. Kevin got close to his wife. Maria, I'm so sorry. He heard his own hoarse voice and choked on his words. Please. He wheezed in her ear and pressed himself even tighter against her. Kevin, stop this whole concert. Maria gathered all her strength and pushed him away from her. Kevin took a step back, still staring into her eyes and watching her reaction. No, this isn't funny. Maria wailed and looked at her watch. I'm late. I really am. Kevin, I'll drag you. Kevin replied in a tone of defiance and began to put on his shoes. Thank you. Kevin drove her to work. He was in a bad mood. He kept thinking about the trash can and the surprised eyes. It's over. Kevin said out loud, cursing himself with his last words. I've been cleaning all morning and I'm still screwed. Kevin hit the steering wheel with all his might, not watching the road. When he looked up, his car was speeding down the highway. He was swerving into the oncoming lane where a huge truck was speeding by. On the slippery road, no one could slow down or swerve. Kevin closed his eyes and fell into darkness. Good evening. Maria, please come to the surgical ward of the regional hospital. Your husband was in a car accident. How he got into an accident? Maria's sisters fell out of her hands in surprise. She opened her mouth, but could not utter a single word. She stood there for some time without moving and staring stupidly at the phone screen. Okay, I'll be right there. Maria barely squeezed out of herself and wiped a tear that rolled out. Maria sank into a chair and stared at one point with a blank stare, trying to stop the trembling in her hands. Her whole life ran before her eyes in a few minutes, and all the plans were broken. Girl, stop. Who are you here to see? Visitor's hours are 3 o'clock p.m. You know, I got a call that my husband had been in an accident. They asked me to come to the surgical ward. The woman in a white coat looked at Maria, shifted her eyebrows, and shook her head unhappily. Put on a row shoes in a basket take and go up to the second floor. Maria, my name is Paul. Kevin and I have been in the same gym for a long time. He has a compound fracture in his right leg, a concussion, two broken ribs, and a lot of soft tissue bruising. We've done everything we can, but we're not unlimited. We don't know how the bones will heal. We may have to do a second surgery and break the leg again. He asked me to call you and let you know where he is. Thank you very much, doctor. Her hands were shaking, her head was shaking, and one thought was on her tongue. Kevin would be fine. He's a lucky man. I believe in him. Maria, on woozy legs, walked out into the hallway. 
She sat on a bench against the wall and closed her eyes. I wish he'd come out of it and not be an invalid. Mary prayed to God and wiped the tears that involuntarily rolled from her eyes. A year passed. Kevin finally recovered and despite his fierce resistance, Maria divorced him, leaving him no chance for reconciliation. While she was taking care of Kevin and bringing him to the hospital, Maria got to know Paul better. Between them, a spark flared up, which ignited into a big blazing fire. When Kevin learned that his ex-wife had a romantic relationship with his friend, he was shocked. To say that he was upset is not to say anything. For a week, he drank and came to his senses, and now he changes girls like gloves. Justifying his behavior by the fact that his beloved wife left him and went to his friend, with whom he ate from the same plate as a child and drank from the same mug. True Kevin has become more discerning and does not throw himself at the first girl he meets without finding out her plans for the future. At first, he looks at her for a few days and then throws himself into the relationship. As in a maelstrom with his head, Sophia Paul met his friend. Kevin takes his son for a full day on Saturdays and they have a great time together. They go for a walk, ride the merry-go-round, buy pizza and cotton candy. Kevin does not forget to remind John that his mom did a very bad thing. 